Today's show brought to you by our friends at the Breeders' Cup. Saturday has a huge slate of Breeders' Cup Challenge Series win and you're in races between Del Mar and Saratoga, all of which you'll be hearing about in one form or another on our network. The Longines Classic has two WEA races with the Jockey Club Gold Cup from Saratoga and the return of Flightline in the Pack Classic. Also covered the Del Mar Handicap, WEA for the Longines Turf, and the Flower Bowl, WEA Action for the Maker's Mark, Philly and Mayor Turf. All winners are going to receive entry fees paid by the Breeders' Cup, a $10,000 award to the nominator, a $10,000 travel allowance for horses stabled outside of Kentucky. You can find coverage on NBC, Peacock, and FanDuel TV. Also, got to remember this, Friday starts the second Breeders' Cup Classic Future Pool Wager. Flightline installed as the 5-2 to two morning line favorite. That pool is going to be open until 6.30, Monday, September 5th. See how the Pack Classic plays out and make your bet on your ADW or at the track. For more information, go to breederscup.com. Hello and welcome to the In The Money Players podcast. This is our show for Labor Day weekend, Labor Day Saturday. We're going to have other content as well for you later on on Labor Day weekend, including full coverage of Kentucky Downs. We've got another show where we're going to be talking all about Del Mar. But before we get to the meat of today's late week show, and there's quite a bit of meat, I did want to do a little flashback to Horse Player Happy Hour and a discussion with Matt Bernier about uh, the Pacific Classic and, generally speaking, the uh, Classic division on this day when you have the opportunity through our friends at the Breeders' Cup to participate in the Futures Pool, the second iteration of this Breeders' Cup Classic Future Pool. You can find it at the track, at your ADWs, have an opportunity to get a future bet down 24 different interests, 23 different horses, and then uh, still an all others tab if you want to get really creative as far as who's going to win this year's Breeders' Cup Classic. Lots of opinions on that topic coming up, but did want to make folks aware of this weekend's Breeders' Cup Future Wager. But now let's go to the videotape. Let's talk about some of these win and you're in races this weekend. I think we got to start with the one that is just going to create such a, a shift, I think, one way or the other in the Breeders' Cup Classic future betting market. And speaking of which, we have another Breeders' Cup future pool this weekend. I'll pull up all the details on that, but look for that at your ADW. You're going to want to see this uh, this race, 8.50 Saturday night Eastern, uh, before you commit to any kind of price, I think, in this uh, in the second future pool that they're doing. First time ever they've done this pool future betting for the Breeders' Cup Classic. And, of course, I mean, there's really one question when it comes to the Pacific Classic this year, Matt. Is Flightline going to continue to be able to do Flightline-like things at a mile and a quarter, or is he going to be vulnerable to one of the others? Well, I mean, if you just look at him for what he's done in his career and you've watched the way that he's finished his races, I mean, I don't think two turns is going to be a problem. I don't think a mile and a quarter is outside of his realm. I had said after that N1X race at Del Mar last September that he looked like he actually wanted to go longer, not shorter. Yep. Um, but then again, if we're just talking, if you if take names out, take all the sort of stories, the pomp and circumstance away, betting a horse at one to five, going two turns for the first time, never mind a mile and a quarter. I mean, just just in my bones, that's a bad bet. Now, I think he's going to win. I think he's, you know, an exceptional talent. But I, I couldn't sit here and say, you know, the problem is, too, I was going to say, you know, if you want to single him in picks, I mean, he in, inherently is going to destroy the value of any real pick, isn't he? Even if you get bombs in some of the other races. So I, I think... You're either speculatively playing against him because there's really been nothing to suggest that he won't continue on. Um, and, and that from a gambling standpoint, that's what it is. Otherwise, you're just going to sit back and see if he can do the job. I don't have an interest in trying to bet against him, um, but I do think he's taken on good horses. I mean, country grammar continues to get, I think, under underrated, sort of disrespected for what he's capable of on his best day. Um, you know, and, and my, my old friend, Royal Ship, who I've, you know, I joked about it, but it was true. Last year, uh, San Diego Day, a year ago, I had Country Grammar and Royal Ship 
one and two in my Breeders' Cup Classic top ten. And a year later, they run one two in the San Diego, and they look like the real you know alternatives to to flight line. I don't know that either of them will beat him, but I at least know Country Grammar will make him earn it. Put it that way. Royal Ship, your guess is as good as mine. What version we get? Yeah, he's a he's a tricky read. I'm I'm going to keep it simple, and I'm I'm in a single flight line, and I'm just going to say. I think he's a freak. I'm not going to take one to nine to win or whatever, but I, I'm going to look at him as a horizontal free square. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I mean, I can just, I can live with it. Like country grammar seems to me a horse that is meant to move forward and looks like one that the same scenario, I think where things go wrong for flight line makes a lot of sense as the one where things could go right for, for country grammar. So that's, that would be um, if, if you made me like make a win bet in the race. But my main action, I think, is just going to be to single and move on. The recent workouts, he looks as good as ever, if not better, which is hard to imagine. You know, you're absolutely right. You, you, you don't get the warm feels as a gambler, not just on the, the question about this horse going this far, but also because – it's hard to trust a horse that is campaigned in, in such a conservative manner. I mean, they're doing, it's not criticizing at all. They're doing an no. incredible job getting the most out of this horse, but at the same time, it surely suggests that there's something underlying that, that could, excuse me, go wrong. And then, you know, you one to nine up in smoke. So it's, it's a, uh, it's a very tricky situation, but I think from a wagering point of view, that's what I'm going to do. And mostly I want to sit back and watch. Yeah, and I guess that's the thing, too. And maybe I'm being a little bit harsh saying, you know, value and picks is is gone. But I feel like, I mean, is it ridiculous to think 80% of picks are going to be singled to him or, or, you know. I'd be vast- okay with that. I, I think I might be getting value if it's only 80%. <laughs> right, yeah, purely on numbers, you're effectively talking about a sort of one to four shot in there. So I, I do understand that part. But it just seems like even if you get chaos in the races leading into it, he inherently is just going to just destroy value unless you do go against the grain and you say, you know what, maybe you're not spreading and you're not playing some massive, massive ticket or multiple tickets that cost, you know, many, many hundreds or thousands of dollars. But you take that speculative approach and say, look, I know country grammar's best game is a mile and a quarter. I know we can run at Del Mar. I know he's in good hands with Baffert and flight line needs to answer X, Y, and Z, you know, is that crazy to think that rather than taking country grammar on the win end, maybe even in doubles, right? The race prior is, I believe, the Del Mar Derby. You know, why not play something into country grammar relatively heavy, knowing he's going to be the second choice in the P Classic? But I would assume in doubles, he's probably going to give you a, a little bit of inflated value. I think maybe, say, he goes off at that seven to two or four to one in the race, maybe he's six or seven to one in a double just because everyone's going to be singled to, to flight line. That's just, you know, again, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here, but yeah. it's going to be very difficult. If you, if you think flight line wins, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to find any kind of real value. I don't disagree. I mean, look, I'm not saying this is a bet of the year. Right. It's more, it's pack classic night. It's a mandatory payout in the pick six. It's a fun sequence with a bunch of stakes races. Cause you mentioned you've got the, uh, the, the Del Mar Derby beforehand. You've also got in the same sequence, the Del Mar mile. And then after it, it's the Del Mar uh, handicap, which is another win in your in race that we'll get to a little bit later in the show. So, I mean, it's, it's, I'm probably playing it. It's probably more of an action thing, but even with my, and this is one thing where I think a lot of people smartly look at an action bet and say, I'm just going to take a shot and bet a little to win a lot. But the way my, the way I just see this race and feel about this horse at this point, I'm going to say I can still do okay with a tight ticket singling this horse. And and that's the approach that I'm going to take in this year's Pacific classic. Any other thoughts on this one, Matt? No, I I just think it's going to be, to, to your point, and I mean, we'll talk about it more when we get into the Jockey Club talk, but that race is going to crystallize what this division is right now, where he either goes out, struts his stuff, wins the way that he's won all these other races, and he becomes, a, you know, I mean, I don't even know him. If I'm guessing, he'd probably be somewhere in that sort of 8-5 to five range for the Breeders' Cup Classic, maybe 7-5, to five, maybe even shorter, who knows. Um, and if he loses, I mean, all bets are off. You, you, you know, I feel like you've got horses that wouldn't have considered it I think about uh, Cyberknife. I had mentioned him. Brad Cox had, had brought up the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. If Flatline loses on Saturday, I can guarantee you he will end up in the Classic instead of the Dirt Mile. Because yeah. I can't imagine, and I say that because I can't imagine the connections of Flatline would go to the Classic at that point. I, it's just maybe I'm being a little bit overzealous there, but I, I think if he loses, 
I can't imagine they would go to that route. No, I think with as brilliant as he's been going shorter, yeah. it, unless it's some strange situation where they both freak and run huge figures and run. I mean, there are scenarios where I think he loses and doesn't go there, but I mean, I almost think he's like a win or run out kind of horse here. And if I'm right about that, then it's, it's classic or it's, you know, something else um, shorter. Today's show brought to you in part by our friends from Gainesway, from top international bloodlines to rising stars on American soil. Gainesway's put together a stallion roster that is not only primed for future success, but currently making its mark on the track led by Caraconti's rising star, Spenderella, who was so impressive out at Del Mar the other week. Make sure to check out their entire roster for 2022 and see for yourself the power, passion, and performance of Gainesway. Check it out at Gainesway.com. Next up in the show, very happy to bring back a popular guest. We did a really nice segment earlier in the summer, if I do say so myself, talking about baby racing generally at Saratoga. Today, we're going to drill down into the specifics. And what a card to do that with four separate two-year-old races. We talked earlier in the meet about how we suspected this might happen with some of the, the more interesting and fuller field two-year-old races maybe happening towards the end of the summer. That's exactly how it turned out. And to talk about it all with us, we have a man who you can hear on his own podcast, the Timeform U.S. Pacecast. You can read his fantastic work in uh, on the Daily Racing Forum. It's also presented on the Naira website. Personally, I can't get enough of David Aragona. David, what's up, my man? Uh, things are going pretty well. Glad to come back on. And boy, there is a lot to talk about from the two-year-old standpoint on the Saturday card. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on, and it kicks off in the very first race where was your eye drawn in here david well i think you've got a couple of horses that are going to take a lot of money in this turf event uh one of those being the todd pletcher trained irad ortiz ridden ari gold uh who's drawn down towards the inside uh this horse is by medallia doro who's obviously uh, a strong turf influence not a ton of turf on the dam side that uh, is half to a turf winner. It's a little more dirt in the second family, actually. Uh, but uh, they must have intentions to get this horse on the turf because this horse is working well enough on the dirt to almost make it a bit surprising that they're not giving him a chance on the dirt. He's been uh, outworking some of Todd Pletcher's decent dirt uh, unraced two-year-olds in the morning. Uh, so it feels like this one is coming in with some ability. Uh, they are, they're confident in turf. They have not given it a turf workout over the Oklahoma course, which sometimes you see from Pletcher. So uh, that's all probably a good sign. And I think this one's going to take a lot of money. And I could say the same about General Jim towards the outside for Shook McGahee. I think uh, the merits of this one are fair fairly obvious $850,000 yearling uh, ran well in the dirt debut uh, kind of curious that maybe they're not giving this one another shot on the dirt as a son of into mischief, but there is turf on the damn side and Shug obviously wants to get this horse right on the grass. So uh, I think that those two are going to take a lot of money. I'm interested in a bigger price than the number one read on drawn down towards the rail for Dale Romans. Kind of a curious situation. They're wheeling back in just one week since running last Saturday, but they entered for turf that day. The race got rained off. Uh, they kindly stayed in to keep it a five horse field. And I think the intention was probably always to get this horse in a turf race. Uh, there's turf from the dam. When I watch this horse run in both career starts, he's got this turfy action to him and uh, he's working. He was working well into his debut. And I've just kind of tabbed this horse as one that I was waiting to see get on turf. And uh, he's finally getting his chance on Saturday. Very interesting. 12 to 1, you made read on on the morning line. I think you'll probably get all of that. And I can I could definitely, it, it's an unusual horse in a good way, because I think some of the things that are unusual about read on will lead to the price tag. A few thoughts on Ari Gold. As you were talking about the decision to run this one long on the turf, I had a flashback. And, I'm, and I don't mean to make an immediate comparison between Ari Gold and the horse I'm about to mention, but I just couldn't help but think of one many moons ago running on Labor Day weekend, highly touted, uh, who I had just said to myself, well, if they're running this horse on turf, is he really that good? Is the hype about this big brown really what it should? And it turned out they were really just looking for distance for that runner, because of course up here, we don't do the two turns dirt. Now, obviously they could wait, they could run longer at Churchill soon, but part of me just doesn't wonder if with Ari Gold, it's it's just a case of wanting that extra ground. And you mentioned the the, nicely uh, thought of unraced maidens that Ari Gold's been working with. 
Also worked with Kaling, who was a, a decent maiden special weight winner running a figure that I think if Ari Gold could replicate, would be a very likely winner of this race. That's a, a two-year-old angle I picked up years ago from uh, Duke and Paul Matisse, looking at who they were working closely with in company and trying to project, well, if that one ran figure X, maybe the other one is capable of running of, is run, of running that uh, a similar figure as well. The other one I wanted to get your uh, thought on in this race was the number nine impeccability. The angle here being, uh, you know, having some, uh, having some decent female side of pedigree, but also just the McPeak stats going along with two-year-olds, which are still pretty strong. I was looking to focus my attention around those two, and I'm certainly going to be uh, taking an extra look at your number one. What were your McPeak runner in here? Yeah, I think the most interesting thing about that horse is that Joel Rosario has been attracted to ride. Uh, he's not really uh, a jockey that McPeak goes to that often. As you said, there is turf pedigree on the dam side. I, I believe the dam on this one is a half brother or half sister, I should say, to uh, I think his name is Swift Warrior, a nice turf uh, stakes winner. Uh, there's turf definitely in that second generation. Dialed in can kind of go either way. He's kind of one of those versatile sires that gets progeny to do anything. Uh, so that one's a little interesting. I don't really have any uh, insight into the workouts on him. So uh, we'll see if he takes money. Let's move on to race number two, where we go seven furlongs on the dirt, as we do several times in the remainder of this card. David, will bring you back in to uh, get an idea of who you think the most interesting two-year-olds are. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious you've got some runners with experience in this race that look like they're going to be pretty tough. Uh, that conversation, I guess, starts with the number seven, Powerful, who just missed on debut, took money that day to get bet down to favoritism for Steve Asmussen. Uh, this was an expensive uh, Cortland Farm purchase by Nyquist. Uh, seems like a horse, at least based on that debut run, that is not going to mind some added ground. Kind of seemed on the far turn, like he was just spinning his wheels a little bit, not really going anywhere, but he kind of responded to the pressure throughout the late and was hitting his best stride at the end. So I think the seven furlongs is going to be right up that horse's alley. The number one full mood madness all also ran well in that same race, finishing about two lengths behind powerful in third, uh, kind of unfortunate for this Michelle Nevin trainee that he drew the rail once again, that's kind of a difficult situation for a young horse. Uh, but, uh, Michelle definitely is one that seems to do better with, uh, her runners that have a little bit of experience. And this one's got an awesome pedigree buy into mischief out of, uh, that excellent dam by the moon that by the light family just produces some excellent, uh, sprinter miler types on the dirt. Uh, so that's definitely one with potential as well. Um, preferred those two to the Todd Pletcher trainee upgrade who could also take some money. Um, that one's coming out of a maiden race that seems decent as the runner at Bourbon Bash came back to it impressively, but uh, was looking to see a little bit more uh, tactical speed from that one in his second start because he was a little bit sluggish in the early stages of his debut. And I personally was not seeing too many firsters that I pegged as live enough to take down those experienced runners in this race. One first, or we should at least pause on here, is the number two, Tappet's Conquest for our uh, friends. Uh, you know, obviously Tappet uh, standing uh, at uh, Gainesway, the sponsors of, of the segment. And Brad Cox obviously wins at a, at a fantastic rate with firsters, but he does even better with horses second time out. And I wasn't wondering if this wasn't one that would benefit from the experience, but Tappet's Conquest certainly one I'm interested to take a look at it in the flesh. Was that your impression as well? Yeah, I feel the same way about Brad Cox. And he's one of those trainers that the, the perception, I think, of how he does with first-time starters is a little out of step with the reality. I think people bet his first-time starters like they do win first time out quite a bit, and the stats say otherwise. Um, really, he's kind of losing around 50% of value when you're betting his first-time starters. The ROI for $2 is hovering around $1. Uh, so uh, I just think this is one that could need a start based on the pedigree, the way he's been working. Just kind of gives me the sense that he's one that's going to benefit from experience and maybe a little more distance. Uh, the one firster in this race that I do want to mention because Bill Mott is debuting a few firsters across these maiden races on Saturday is the number six Parkway, who does have much more of a turf pedigree, but of all the firsters that Bill is debuting, this is the one that I like the workouts on the best. Not saying that he's ready to take down the experienced runners in this field, just this horse seems like a really impressive physical uh, specimen and horse that has some ability. Maybe it's going to be on turf down the line, but he's the one I would take a look at.
that workout two back that you can find on XBTV was very impressive uh, on Parkway. I agree with you, but I think you and I both in these seven furlong races, especially over this Saratoga surface, really love the idea of experience, especially for a horse who's run near the par speed figure, which I think is about an 80 at this level. And that made me extremely attracted to powerful. The one thing that held me back about powerful and tell me if you think there might be any signal in this, the fact that five have come back to run from that July 23rd race without winning. It just gave me a little bit of pause at a short number in a race where there are some other ways to go. Yeah. I mean, I think you do have to look at that stuff. It can be tough sometimes to assess the quality of these two-year-old maiden races. Uh, some of those that finished behind these two have run back. I don't think the winner is yet run back. So we'll see. Uh, maybe the horses that did well in that race are the ones that you want. Uh, but from a visual standpoint, I just kind of got that sense that Powerful was one that would improve with added ground. But I mean, look, Steve Asperson's kind of changed up his pattern to what we were used to seeing maybe five years ago, where he's had the first type starters really cranked up to win on debut over the past several years. Uh, I think historically people expected his runners to improve second time out. But uh, if you look at the five-year stats and formulator or wherever you look up your stats, uh, it's really better with first time starters at Saratoga recently. So uh, they have not been improving second time out. This just struck me as one that would have a license to do so. And another thing that you could drill down a little more and might give you even more uh, encouragement about powerful. Yes, five have come back, five have not won but every single one improved their buyer speed figure. Summon your courage going from a 67 the last day to an 80 next out Mullingar going from a 44 to a 60. And then down the field, Balsa and Western Gent ran very low figures, but at least they both improved them next out. And then Bay Lounge went from a nine to a 66. So I'm going to decide that that was just a fleeting thought that I'm not going to worry about. And I think I'm, I'm I think I'm going to feel pretty good about getting stuck into powerful in this spot and then using a few others as as backups at the end of the day. Any other thoughts on race two or shall we jump ahead, my friend? I'm ready to jump ahead. Let's do it. Race six, seven on the dirt once again for these two year olds. Uh, same same situation and a big full field. Oh, we have mind tap. The horse that we one of those horses we were talking about that worked well with the the Pletcher Furster we talked about in in race one so you can do a little morning collateral form example with that one but who are you most interested in here? Yeah, the workouts are definitely worth watching with MindTap and Ari Gold because I know they worked together at least three times, uh, maybe more than that. I only I watched three of them uh, dating back to early August. And it's kind of interesting. Ari Gold was outworking MindTap both, I think, on August 6th and August 13th, pretty clear in that gate drill on August 13th. And uh, interesting that Ari Gold lands in the turf race because in their most recent work together on August 26th, it was the first time that MindTap kind of turned the tables and seemed to out outwork Ari Gold. Uh, so maybe he's just one that's kind of been coming along a little bit more slowly and MindTap uh, has kind of earned his way into the starting gate with that positive workout last week. But uh, that was the first time that I kind of thought to myself this horse would be ready to win on debut. Obviously, there's pedigree here for him to go longer. $725,000 son of Tappet is a half-brother to the multiple grade one dirt route winner, Carolina. So uh, definitely pedigree there for Mind Tap to be sort of the classic distance type. And we'll see how he does on debut. Kind of surprisingly, when you look up the stats on Todd Pletcher, he doesn't do that well, or at least he hasn't over the past five years in the six and a half to seven furlong maiden events at Saratoga with the first time starters. I guess he's just kind of tapping horses for these races that want to go even longer down the line. So maybe they're not always the most cranked up to win on debut. Uh, so uh, I'm kind of a little bit wary of mind tap is one that could take a lot of money in this race, but Another horse that I do expect to take a lot of money in this race would be the number nine champion's dream, uh, a son of justify going out for Danny Gargan, expensive two-year-old in training purchase, uh, working 20 and four fifths at the OBS sale, uh, good precocious pedigree on the damn side. He's out of dancing in her dreams. Who was a grade two winner as a two-year-old, I believe for Mark Cassie. And um, I have not seen any of the workouts. None of them are on XBTV where I uh, do my workout video work, uh, but I've seen in the Deer of Clocker report and I've heard some buzz about this horse that he is working exceptionally well. I know one of the drills was in company with Gargan's older mare stakes mare ice princess, and he's just worked favorably with all of the horses he's been paired with. So uh, I'm expecting this one to take a lot of money. 
the justified babies feel like they're all running, <laughs> at least the ones that I've been paying attention to. And I've heard similar hype on Champion's Dream. Definitely looks like one to keep on side in this spot. It is funny, just going back to MindTap for a minute, that it does feel like there was almost a, a change in plan after that gate drill on August 26 with those two in company. Prior to that, it felt like maybe MindTap would have been the one pointed to the to the turf race and Ari Gold, the one pointed here. So it'll be interesting to see. It does feel like Pletcher makes a lot of the right calls when it comes to these things. I like the fact that Irad was on for the for the gate drill and shows up here. But I mean, your, your point is certainly correct about when you when you look into the specifics of the Pletcher numbers in these spots, maybe there's an opportunity to to find a little bit of value elsewhere. And maybe that value can come from Champions Dream in this spot. Were there any others that caught your eye in here? Yeah, and I'll be interested to see how they bet this race. I think I made Champions Dream the favorite on the morning line. Horses that are working as well as that one, uh, the public at Saratoga is typically onto them, so I, I think he's probably going to take a lot of money in this race because uh, a lot of the other first-time starters for the top barns, I think Bill Mata is two in here. There's another Pletcher. Uh, there's a Cherie DeVoe. I don't think that the workout reports are going to quite be there on those horses. So uh, I wanted to go in a different direction. And I actually made my top pick the number one, Heart and Soul, going out for George Weaver. Uh, Golden Sense is just kind of an underrated, versatile, all-around good sire. Uh, there's not a ton of pedigree on the dam side, but I did see one of this horse's workouts back in early August albeit working with a horse that uh, might not be one of the better two-year-olds out there, surprise payoff, who I believe is running in another division of this race on Saturday. But I just liked what I saw from Heart and Soul, uh, a horse that was never asked for his best in that uh, minute and four-fifths workout, just looked like he was traveling really easily, uh, seems like one that might have a little bit of ability, and going out for this barn is probably not going to attract that much attention. Yeah, going out for our pals at Black Type Thoroughbreds who've had so much success over the last few years. And we've talked about a couple of these maidens, uh, first-time starters, especially breaking from the rail at seven furlongs. Clearly not a preference of yours, but do you think it's a case of the right one just can overcome it? Or do you feel like maybe you get compensated in price because the public also is a bit sour on the first start from the rail at seven? Yeah, I don't view it as a big negative. I feel like uh, it's just more of what it's like a bit of racetrack lore and not necessarily something that's always statistics based. I mean, we've seen a couple of nice priced two year olds debut from the rail and do very well. That Bill Mott trained socially selective earlier in the meet. Uh, that Cherie DeVoe first time starter last week, whose name was escaping me now. Both of those were working well and escaped at big prices, potentially because they were on the rail. So sometimes uh, these are not horses that you want to avoid because if they break soundly, uh, the rail is not a bad place to be. It's a, it's a great point. If you've got speed, it could be an advantage, uh, potentially. Uh, not that the rail's been wonderful at Saratoga, but it, it's it's certainly me. It's certainly not something that would make me toss out a horse reflexively. Let's talk about our fourth and final two-year-old race on this card. And this one, um, an important one in particular, if you're playing the pick six, because it kicks it off. Race number eight, seven furlongs on the dirt once again. And a very interesting looking field and some interesting form lines come into play here. Where shall we go first? Yeah, I feel like we should probably start with the experienced runners. And I'll say of the three divisions of this seven furlong two-year-old maiden race on Saturday, this does feel like the strongest one. Uh, we've got uh, three horses coming out of that seven furlong race run earlier in the meet on Whitney Day that was won by the impressive Steve Aspison trained Disarm. Actually, the second, third, and fifth place finishes from that affair uh, Croupy to the outside is one that I would imagine is going to attract a lot of attention for trainer Todd Pletcher. Uh, I know that uh, people were pretty impressed by the visual of his debut when he just looked like he had no idea what he was doing for the first half mile of that race and then just kind of figured it out once he got a lot of encouragement from Luis Saez at the quarter pole and basically rocketed home and passed, I think, seven horses in the pat the, the final quarter mile. So uh, definitely one that I think, uh, you know, turned a lot of heads that day. Is he going to run as well in his second start? What do you make of that kind of backwards way that he ran his first start? I'm not sure about that. I, I don't always love when these Todd Pletcher runners uh, who are so well-schooled in the mornings prior to they, their debuts show such unprofessionalism in the afternoon. To me, that's a bad sign, even though this horse did run well that day. And 
Todd does not have good numbers with maiden second time starters at Saratoga, basically with any stats you look at. So if this one's a short price, I'm a little bit skeptical. The horse that I would want out of that August 6th race is actually Rocket Can, who finished uh, farthest back of the trio exiting there, um, even behind his stablemate Arthur's Ride. Um, Rocket Can, to me, just felt like he got a good educational run that day. Like Krupe, he was a little far back in the early going, but... I thought Junior Alvarado just kind of let him settle there. It's not like he was under this strong drive and wasn't responding. Um, it just kind of uh, looked like a horse that they have probably pegged for longer distances and maybe needed that first start. I had liked the way that he trained into that race. I really liked the way he's trained out of that race. And Bill Mott is a trainer who doesn't often win with first-time starters sprinting on dirt uh, with the two-year-olds at Saratoga. He does better with some older runners, but he does have good stats across the board with two-year-old second-time starting maidens. So I think Rocket Can is uh, a candidate to take a step forward. But uh, even though the runners with experience look strong, there are some first-time starters that are worth taking a look at too in this field. Definitely. W. Nell, one that I was wanting to keep on side for sure. I agree with you. Uh, everything you said about Rocket Can looks like one that I think is going to improve and would be my my top pick in the race. But uh, and I respect for for Arthur's ride, the the stablemate who was in that same race. But of the firsters, W. Nell is the one that I wanted to talk about. Good magic off to a good start with firsters. Productive dam, six winners, including a two-year-old stakes winner. And the workouts, some of which have been in company with an older stakes runner, I thought looked pretty solid. But I always want your opinion about these workouts because, you know, you seem to have a real knack for it. What do you think of w &L? Yeah, two of the workouts that I can see here were uh, in company with Tax, who's running in the Jockey Club Gold Cup later today. Uh, I think Tax is a good workhorse and is going a little better than this horse. Uh, but uh, I think just the fact that Gargan would pair him with that one in the morning is probably a vote of confidence for WNL. Uh, we'll see how he does. I mean, Danny Gargan is not a trainer that has particularly strong stats with first time starters in any situation. Uh, and I think in these dirt sprints on a big Saturday, at Saratoga. He's not one that you really think of as a candidate to win two out of the three, but he does seem to have some talented two-year-olds. So we'll see how that works out. Um, there are a couple for other first-time starters that I'd want to talk about in here. Uh, the number eight, Juan Valdez, uh, $900,000 son of Medallia Doro going out for West Point and Partners. Uh, this one appears to have a lot of talent to my eye. His sales workout at Facing Tipton at Gulfstream in March is one of the most impressive two-year-old sales workouts that I've seen on any horse that I've looked at any, any of these Saratoga maiden races all year. His 10 flat was just really impressive. This beautiful fluid stride to the horse. Uh, only saw one workout, the last one on August 26th, and kind of an interesting one to watch uh, because he was working with another horse that also seemed a little green. They both kind of broke from the gate and didn't know if they were supposed to go forwards or sideways or wherever. Um, and I kind of went back and put a stopwatch on it just to see. And I think they, the two of them went their first furlong in like 14 and change. But then after that, Juan Valdez really leveled off and that workout officially is in a minute and a fifth. And I think he went his four furlongs after that first furlong in like 46 and change and was doing it under absolutely no pressure. Uh, just a really beautiful mover and a horse that I, I, seems to have a lot of ability. Um, he's of course a half brother to uh, excellent sire and grade one winner constitution and got Medallia Doro on the top. So uh, bred to be a good horse just feels to me like one that might not be mentally prepared to win first time out. I'm not sure about that, but there's so much natural ability. I'm not going to be surprised when he gives a good account of himself. And the other first time starter that I think is interesting and is actually the one that I prefer from the Todd Pletcher barn is the number nine fantasist, who's probably going to be a decent price because he's got Manny Franco on board and croupy has got Irad Ortiz. Uh, but I, I just like fantasist workouts. Another one that seems like he's definitely going to want to go longer but when you watch him run, he, he kind of almost looks like a greyhound, like he really lowers his head to the ground and stretches himself out and has just looked like he's traveling well in all of the workouts that I've watched. The negative is that he's by Always Dreaming, and Always Dreaming has had no success with his first crop so far. I mean, I think he's 0 for 20-something with his first-time starters, uh, but this one looks to have some ability, so I'll be interested to see how he gets bet and how he runs. Great notes, not just for today, but going forward. Always appreciate having David Aragona on our shows. David, we'll keep uh, reading your work and enjoying it, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me on, Pete.
It's been an amazing season of races at the Spa, and it's not over yet. Following an outstanding Travers Week, the final weekend at Saratoga will feature seven graded stakes, including the 104th running of the Grade 1 $1 million Jockey Club Gold Cup, a win in your in race for the Breeders' Cup Classic. The Gold Cup is going to feature some of the premier horses, including... Bill Mott's Olympiad looking to regain form after snapping a four-race win streak at the Whitney. You can join Acacia Courtney, Maggie Wolfendale, Jonathan Kinchin, and the rest of the Naira team as they bring you live racing expert analysis and picks. For live Saratoga showtimes, you can go to inthemoneypodcast.com slash TV to get that complete schedule. And don't forget, there's a weekly Saratoga online contest with a $300 buy-in. You can find the details at the Naira website, naira.com slash Saratoga slash racing handicapping hyphen contest. Bit of a mouthful, that one, but go there. You'll navigate. You'll find it. Great game to get involved in. You can also learn about the Saratoga showdown over at naira.com. Next up in the show, very happy to bring in a man who's been on these airwaves uh, more than anyone who isn't named me. He is coming to us from uh, La Casa Roja over in Saratoga. He's Jonathan Kinchin. What's up, JK? How are you? It wouldn't be a JK appearance without him getting stuck on mute. Look, once uh, most people know, look what happened was, is the tab where this was open was not at the end of all my tabs. Uh, like yeah. open. So I, I was I was ready. I just went to the wrong tab and then I had to find it. So I timed <laughs> it perfectly. We consider you getting stuck on mute a feature, not a bug. But anyway, how are you doing? Everything good? You keeping in one piece here? Could be a long meet. You know, I got to be honest with you. I got to be honest with you. This meet, typically, I don't ever want it to end. You know, even though we're busy and we're working and whatever, um, I, um, I've had enough. <laughs> no, I don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm having You're a blast. one of those like, locals. You've become one of those locals who's like, ah, we can't wait for you people to leave. That's no, you no, 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 not that part of it. It's just it's been a tough meet. Like it's just been it's been hard, but also like. Um, you know, just it's, it's and plus I have a fun trip on the horizon, you know, going to a friend's wedding uh, overseas. And, and so that'll be kind of fun. And that's like the day after the meet. So then that's probably dangling as well to, to kind of, you know, make me want to make me want to wrap it up. We got 13 races on Saturday, 12 on Sunday, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 11 on Monday. Um, but the big horse, I think, is going to run Monday, by the way. I, I think cross cross fingers the race goes. They used the race today with uh, Kinchin, mile and an eighth on the turf. Nice. What's the report on how she's doing? I don't think she's, you know, we'll see. I, I think that they've, she's been, uh, not a mile and eighth, sorry, mile and 16th. Um, I think they've just been, you know, taking their time. The race just hasn't gone. She's been ready for a couple of weeks. So okay. we'll see. I can't wait to see that. That'd be very uh, a nice little uh, treat for for opening day. While I've got you, before we dive into the Saratoga Pick Six, I do want to ask you about the Travers. We haven't on these airwaves gotten to hear your opinion yet about how good Epicenter was and whether or not you think he's a serious contender for the Breeders' Cup Classic. Matt and I had sort of differing views, with me being uber positive and him being a little bit like hold your horses. I think that figure might be a little high. Where do you stand? Um, I am in the category. I'm probably closer with you. Um, I, I would say that I'm in the, he's definitely a contender. And not only is he a contender as a three-year-old who could take another step forward. So, so let's say the 112 was a little bit fast, right? So let's say he's a 108 guy or 107, 106, whatever. He's a three-year-old and there's still an opportunity for him to take another step forward. The distance obviously is not an issue for him. Um, so I think if anyone's going to beat, Life is good or flight line. It's 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 this horse. Um, I'd be shocked, absolutely shocked, if any other horse out of the three we just named won the Breeders' Cup Classic. <laughs> While we're talking Breeders' Cup Classic and flight line, is he nailed on in this race uh, Saturday night? Yeah, I think he's in a gallop in there. I, I think he's one of those horses. People are gonna. I mean, I hope people make the mistake that they're questioning the mile and a quarter for him. There's a chance. There's a chance. Flight line can't get a mile and a quarter. Um, but the horses he's facing on Saturday you can get a mile and three quarters. <laughs> I can't wait to see how it plays out. That's going to be very exciting. Set your, set your alarms for that one, folks. Um, wherever you are, whether it's in Saratoga or elsewhere, I forget the post time of that race. I'll, I'll, I'll mention late. that. Yeah. I'll, I'll, mention I'll, that I'll have it in seconds. Okay. I think we'll, it's a, uh, 
it will do that thing where I just like where I do, where I do that thing where I say I'm doing that thing. It's eight thirty Eastern. Eight thirty Eastern. Okay. Eight thirty uh, Eastern. So set and your- the pick five starts with the Grade Two Del Mar Mile at seven Eastern. Seven Eastern. That's kind of perfect right after Saratoga. And we will have a whole show on that, by the way. I've got Scott Shapiro and Frank Scatoni, who did such a good job earlier in the meet on the Del Mar pick six. I think they only went five or six, but there was a lot of great info in there. And that we'll be on doing that whole thing. So, yeah, I take it back. Set your alarm for the whole pick six at uh, at Del Mar on Saturday night. But right now we're going to talk about the pick six at Saratoga. And it starts off with a race David and I were just talking about. So I'll summarize my thoughts extremely quickly. Uh, I really like Rocket Can, just like David said, look to be figuring things out on debut. Uh, This is a barn that typically does much better with horses second time out. I thought it was really interesting that Rocket Can was bet down below Arthur's ride that day. Arthur's ride ended up uh, finishing ahead of him, but I think Rocket Can has more scope for improvement. And I just think that's going to be a key form line. If there was such a thing as a future book for the Kentucky Derby, I think Disarm, the winner of that race, would be near the top of the, the market there. I, I like both these horses. I'm going to use both Rocket Can and Arthur's Ride. And then I'm very attracted to the, the four W Nell. And I mentioned why in the, in the other segment. Just big, uh, very useful female pedigree, good magic off to a good start, and uh, working in company with tax. I think there might be some signal in that. 6-4. And uh, actually, I don't have the numbers correct in front of me. I wrote down six, four, and four. So it's clearly not that. I'll get that corrected real quick. <laughs> and then we'll bring JK in to, uh, to, give, to give his thoughts on this one. It is six, four, and where is this other horse? Three, six, four, and three. JK, what do you think? Um, well, so we'll start with, uh, there's a, I have a couple of thoughts here and I have some, some good kind of behind the scenes stuff for players that are looking at this race. The first couple things is that, this race is one of three of the two-year-old races that was split. I don't know if you and David talked about that. Yes, we went over split. all of them. Right. So there's three races. They made three. They had that many entries that they made three races. So the first thing I want to note is with the 10, Krupe. Louis Saez did not take off. Louis, yep. I, I ran into Kieran. Kieran gave the call to Suge and couldn't, like, spin Suge because the way the race fell. That's why Louis is not on Krupe. So it, it, you know, just everyone, it's not like they took Louis off or I read it. Just don't get carried away with that. Um, the other thing is the nine uh, fantasist. Uh, this is a horse that was bought and always dreaming that was bought for $550,000 at the phasic Tipton Timonium sale. I was at that sale um, doing that phasic Tipton documentary where JK bought his first horse. And, and it's important to note that, you know, David has expressed how, David said earlier on the show how poorly Always Dreaming has kind of had a start as a sire. Maybe he'll turn that around. But I think it's if he's doing so poorly, then this horse sold for 550. The thing must be a runner. It's Robert Luana Low means our friend Jacob West purchased the horse. And if you look through the results of these two-year-old races, Jacob West knows what he's doing in this arena. And I know that George Weaver was actually interested in trying to buy this horse that's always dreaming. The price just got too high when we were at the sale. So I think this is a probably a talented racehorse, an athletic racehorse, and one that I would make sure I didn't get beat by. I'll use a little nine, a little ten. I understand your point with the six rocket can. And I just want to mention to the people that are listening to this show, um, Danny Gargan has been very, very high on the four. I'll let Pete pronounce the name there. But uh, been very, very high. Uh, with this horse and he worked with tax so obviously he's got a little bit of ability w and l that's that that's that one so i'm writing down 10 9 6 and 4 for you any other numbers you want in there do you want to grade them as a's and b's at all um no i mean look croopy's got the experience you want to you want to probably use him as an a type uh the nine i'm gonna have to use as an a type uh the six rocket can has that experience as well. I guess if I wanted to get a little bit more aggressive, this might be a type of horse I can move back to a B horse. The figure that he earned last time wasn't blazing fast, but he does have some experience. And then, you know, it's what's the point of putting your ear to the streets and listening to this info. If you're not going to try to capitalize, I'll use uh, Danny Gargan's horse as an A as well. All right, let's move on to race number nine. We've got an allowance optional claimer going a mile and a 16th on the turf. JK, we'll keep it with you. We'll let you lead off with this one. Yeah, this is a spot where I clicked the wrong past performances. You know, analyze it's a horse I've always kind of just like, well, 
I've loved him since I stopped having to hate him. H analyze it, made the lead on Catholic Boy twice when I needed him for a score and then gave it up to Catholic Boy. Thank goodness I can still sleep at night because Catholic Boy went on to be a really good horse. But analyze it's a horse where I feel like Chad Brown tries to selectively spot this horse in places where he can win. I don't think he wants to lose the horse, so he tries to be uh, aggressive. The other horse that I love in this spot is the Four Sanctuary City. He's always just kind of been cool. He shows up. He makes that late run. It's a little bit interesting that's to note that that, uh, that that Kendrick isn't there. Kendrick's always there, it feels like. Um, and, and so I don't know if it was a decision they wanted to take him off because he's on a 30-to-1 shot. I'm assuming that, that he didn't pick that horse. But we'll see what Trevor does with uh, – with uh, Sanctuary City, and then the uh, the horse towards the outside, the ten eyes on target. Who uh, you know, it's Mike Maker, it's turf, it's, it's two turn turf. Is a horse that has some back numbers as well. I'll try to get through with those horses. Maybe using the other Maker Ocean um, Atlantica as a uh, or a, 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 Atlantique as a uh, as a B type. All right. So the way I got you there is two four. 10 as A's with the nine as a B. You, met, you mentioned a lot of horses I was looking at, excuse me, but not my top pick. Number five, graded on a curve. I want to get your thought on this one. Had a rough trip last time at Belmont, I thought, checking and shuffling in what ended up being a merry-go-round race with the first three early, with the first three across the line. I really like the run two back and just noted that this horse has been bet hard and run well against a similar caliber of horse as today. And I was envisioning a nice stalk and pounce type trip for graded on a curve um, in a race where I think there's plenty of speed. You give that one any count? Well, you know, look, he, he's 0 for 5 at Saratoga. And what does that necessarily mean? It, I think when you're looking at turf horses, you can ask yourself, does it mean that they don't like the inner turf? Do they not like the widener? Um, I just, you know, 0 for 5 at Saratoga. And any time that I look at a Chad Brown horse and they look similar to other horses, I'm going to typically try to find ways to beat them because we know that they're going to be, uh, I don't want to say over bet. They're going to be heavily bet. You know, and I think David Aragona does a great job at the morning line of predicting where those, that Chad Brown money's going to come, but I, I'd be shocked. If this horse goes off at eight to one, just because it's, it's Chad. And then in the pick six, he'll definitely be shorter than eight to one. Yeah, that's fair. Fair concerns. I've got a, a five, four uh, on the top line with Sanctuary City. I, I agree. Just very mm -hmm. consistent from a figure point of view and could be the best closer. And I like the form of that last race with Soldier Rise and come back to run third in the grade one last weekend. So for me, probably five, four on the A line. And I might mess around with the other three JK mentioned two, nine and ten as B's. Actually, I'll write that down in the official notes that we send out to our In The Money Plus subscribers. And with that, we will proceed to race number 10. And we've got graded stakes action, win and you're in action. We're going to go back to an old day on the show, JK. How few words can you do this race in? You know, I was going to do it in three, but there's a couple of thoughts I want to say. So okay. it'll, it'll be fast, though. I was just setting I mean, up to say Warlike Goddess is going to, go to yeah, race. 11, she, she, Warlike Goddess is going to win this race. But I will say Capital Structures is a little bit interesting if you're looking for an alternative because that race was so slow last time. Capital Structure had no reason to win that race and still won going away. Maybe Capital Structure is just getting really good. I also want to say this idea with Warlike Goddess running in the Breeders' Cup turf at a mile and a half. I understand it, right? She likes distance. But one thing you'll notice in Warlike Goddess's races, it just feels like Joel's always in trouble because she's loaded and she wants to go and they're going slow and he's trying to cover her up and he's trying to wait to the last possible minute. Well, what's wrong with the mile and 316ths of the Philly and Mayor uh, turf at Keeneland? where they're going to run away from her a little bit. So she doesn't have to be, you know, aggressively wrangled. He can just kind of let her do her thing, be comfortable, and then kick for home. We'll see what they decide to do, but I don't think they have to run her in the Breeders' Cup mile. Or, uh, excuse me, the Breeders' Cup turf. Four, that's an interesting point, and we'll see what they decide to do. Obviously, one of the stories we're going to be uh, following with great interest. So you'll have 80% of your play through the four and, and, and some backups through the one, or is it more like a 95-5? How would you describe it? 95-5. You know, just a little, you know, she would capital structure would never be more than a seahorse for me. Um, yeah, I guess if your other opinions and the ticket structure isn't going to crush you too much by using as a B, I just hate when you 2B situations – and you, next thing you know, you spent $300 on 2B tickets with this horse that Capital Structure, you might be better off just kind of creating a whole nother ticket with Capital Structure. You yep, know, takes with all your best to, opinions elsewhere. Right. Like yeah. Single a horse like Sanctuary City with Capital Structure or 
or single that favorite baby that you like in the first leg of the pick six. If you miss there, come back with the pick five using uh, capital structure in the pick five as a kind of a saver insurance type. So lots of different ways you can do it. Let's talk about race number 11. It's the grade one Jockey Club Gold Cup win and you're in action for the Breeders' Cup Classic. And I think the first question you have to answer in here is what do you do with Olympiad? I'm inclined to give him a bit of a pass for the last race. It was an unusual track with the track taking all that water in a short period of time when it was not sealed. And I just think he got his doors blown off, frankly, by life is good. And I think this situation could work out a lot better for him and be more like the races where he had a lot of success, where he's able to be close and keep up and gallop along and finish. So I'm going to give him a pass for the last day and see what happens there. I don't want to get beat by American Revolution, though. Olympiad beat him rather easily earlier in the year, but there's a chance I'm just wrong and Olympiad's going the wrong way. And American Revolution is a grade one winner who's been working well, and I just don't want to discount him too much. I was going to try to get through 2-5. What do you think, JK? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to forgive Olympiad for his last race, but I'm not going to forgive him in the category of does he want to get a mile and a quarter? I mean, look, his pedigree is Spitestown. Um and, and not that he can't get a mile and a quarter, but it doesn't scream, I want to go a mile and a quarter against some of these horses whose pedigrees do scream, I want to go a mile and a quarter. Um, you know, I don't want to get beat in the pick five or the pick six. If Gargan wins, Sanctuary City wins, you know what I mean? I hit Warlike Goddess, and then I try to get cute like the internet and let Olympiad beat me, right? <laughs> because Olympiad's likely going to be favored, I can use him as an A horse use other horses as a horses. And I am expressing my opinion by not pressing a horse. That's going to be so short. I'm saving with him in that a line. So I'll use him as an a, although I'm against him because I know that the world likes to think that if you're against a horse, you're supposed to be the toughest guy in the world and throw the horse. And then you're tough. And you're now you're, your EV. I'm not doing that. I'm not getting beat by this horse. If I hit these other two legs, American Revolution will be an A horse for me. First Captain will be an A horse for me. You know, he he wants this distance, right? He wants to go the further they'll write races. First Captain will show up in all of them. Dynamic one, it's Todd Pletcher. Todd gets these dirt horses to improve later in their careers. I'm not going to be beat by him. And then keep me in mind, I has I think has another opportunity to take a step forward. He had some triple digit buyers when he was before uh, or triple digit type figures prior to uh, switching to Todd. And I think he's only going to continue to get better in Todd's barn. So I'm going to spread in this race. I don't have a strong opinion in here. My strong opinion lies, uh, I think, you know, in, in other spots in here. Uh, I'm going to just try to stay alive in this race. Did you get a story about Saez ending up on first captain instead of American Revolution? I did not. I would guess it. A, I would just guess it's a, it's, it's either a choice or a should thing, you know, where like they just didn't want to take off or they gave the call or maybe American Revolution wasn't going to go here. So they gave the call to first captain and then now American Revolution decided to run in here. It's probably one of those deals, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, that was, that's what I was guessing. I didn't have any signal in it, but since you had, you knew something about the merry-go-round jockey musical chairs earlier, I figured I'd ask, but I'm, I'm writing you down two, five, six, seven, eight, just use them equally is that is that about right or would you want to grade yeah yeah that? yeah just because i'm just not like i said i'm not i'm not gonna have i'm not gonna hit those first two legs and then and then you know die on my sword of, of trying to beat olympiad he's got the fastest speed figures i just think he's gonna be a little shorter than he needs to be it's number 12 is a claiming event for three and up going one mile on the dirt my mind my brain went right to the 10 midnight worker first start on dirt as a gelding running in a claiming race for the first time, second off a layoff, and might end up being alone on the lead in a race where there doesn't appear to be a ton of speed. And then I respect the four notable exception as well. Dropping in class for shrewd connections fits well on figures and form. Nothing clever for me. Ten and four. How did you see it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not crazy about the ten. Um, you know, if you start at the bottom of the past performances, made in special weight, first out winner, then goes in a stake, hits the board. Then they switch turf. Then they go back dirt, then turf again. And then they have a break. They show up turf and now they're in for attack. I just, I think it might be a giveaway. I mean, I know Rapoli likes to win races on Saturdays at Saratoga, but 
you know, the horse can win, but it's, you know, it's not the type of horse I can single. I'm going to use the eight, one more baby. First off the claim um, from Phil Bauer, uh, the connections, D'Angelo have been, have been doing extremely well at this meet. They've been doing well for the year. Got a fast number last time for Phil. It's almost like Phil got the horse right, put him in this right spot and then got him some confidence. And now I'm, I'm thinking that maybe D'Angelo can find a way to, to keep, uh, to keep that rolling with this horse. Rhea's angel switching to Rudy Rodriguez. I think that there's an opportunity to make some money this last weekend with Rudy because everyone's off. Everyone's <laughs> he can't win. Everyone's you're going to get three to four points higher on every Rudy horse, just because of the way that it's all um, been kind of unfolding throughout this meet. So the five Rhea's angel, I'll try to beat the 10 with. And then also, like you mentioned, the four notable ex uh, exception uh, for Matt Shire and, and our friends at 10 strike. All equal A line here, eight, 10, five, four. Or are you going to try to beat the 10 out of everything? Uh, yeah, no, four, five, um, eight, 10. The 10 is one of those horses. Again, I'm going to try to beat them. But here's what I'm saying if, if I hit Gargan in the first leg and I hit Sanctuary City and Olympiad wins, or not even Olympiad, let's say that Keep Me in Mind wins, I want to be the guy who didn't hit the pick five with all these great opinions because I tried to beat. Midnight Worker, I'll use him as an A, and I think that that's an equitable uh, way for me to express my opinion. I'm using him equally to horses that are bigger prices. I agree. Paul Matisse had a great post about this that I somehow missed first time around, that we should really turn into a blog post about his way of looking at what EV really means in a pick five pool uh, or pick six pool. Very, very, you know, surprise, surprise, Paul Matisse comes up with something clever. Paul Matisse, who single-handedly saved my Travers Day by turning me around on, on a couple of horses, most notably Gufo. Um, love that guy. Anyway, let's move to the nightcap. Saratoga's 13th race, maiden claimer for New York bred, three and up, Phillies and Mares going five and a half on the turf. JK, how are we going to get paid? I'm going to single. Uh, I'm going to single the 11 quick power nap. Uh, everything I like to see in these types of situations. You have a horse drawn outside, has the best pace figures, has the best speed figures, has the best rider, and is dropping from maiden special weight to maiden climbing. Ice cold in the end right there with quick power nap. I think he'll be tough to beat as long as Joel doesn't do one of those tricky Joels. He's got to be forward, <laughs> hold his position. You know, um, the drop, I think, will, will prove to be uh, to be a huge thing. Won't have to work as hard early to stay close. And we'll be able to be in the clear, won't get stopped, and should be able to grind these horses down. Have you had a few quick power naps this meet? I don't, I mean, I don't take naps. I wake up and feel awful when I take naps. <laughs> um, I've taken naps on Mondays and Tuesdays, if you know what I mean. Like, those days can be, you know when you're trying to recover, like you're just laying around all day, you fall asleep for 12 minutes, but I don't take, I don't take naps on, I don't take naps on race days. I'm with you on quick power nap. You made the case. It just, just looks like the fastest horse dropping in powerhouse connections and should get a great trip. I will give a little shout as a backup for me for the nine Eli dancer improved a lot in the first start on turf. That's one of the angles I'm always droning on about on here and i thought moved a little uh, early into that fast pace just going down late uh, maybe with a more even run through can improve but most of it's going to be going through quick power nap for me and that's all the time we have jk appreciate having you on and we'll uh we gotta we gotta talk about your travel schedule and see what we can uh what we can do about getting on in september sounds like you're going to be a busy boy it's it's, it's going to be a, a hectic couple of weeks but it'll be fun and uh and uh i'll have my laptop Okay, so we we we'll have the production meeting outside the show, but you won't be a ghost. You will you'll be you'll be able to pop on for a thing or two. It sounds like. I'll try my hardest. <laughs> we will be talking soon. Cheers, my friend. If you're a fan of what we do over here at In the Money Media, there's lots of ways you can help. Some of them don't cost a thing. Talk all the time at the end of the show about how it helps when you rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or over on our YouTube channel. That's still the case. There's also our free newsletter, inthemoneypodcast.com slash email, where you'll get some unique content and also just links to all the shows and reminders of everything going on on the network. A very important one to follow. And then if you do want to help us out a little bit more, you can spend a little money. You can support our sponsors, betting our partner tracks and all that and checking out the other folks that uh, do business with us. Or you can sign up for our plus service where you'll get extra content as well as little digests of all the picks from the shows. JK, extra analysis on Saturdays. Lots of other fun stuff going to be having 
special daily plus only content as well for Kentucky Downs, as well as free shows for every day of Kentucky Downs. Anyway, if you want to learn more about Plus, check out inthemoneypodcast.com slash plus. Up next in the show, very happy to bring in the man we turn to when it comes to all things Woodbine. Going to be hearing a lot about Woodbine on the network. Their big week, their other big week, next week with the Woodbine Mile. Looking to make my triumphant return to Toronto after several years. Cannot wait. Uh, We don't have... um, any uh, grade one winning your in action this weekend, but we do have some stakes action and that's where we'll start with our friend, Drew Coatney. Drew, how are things? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, we're, we're going to finally execute the brisket this weekend. So for those who want to follow along, Drew Coatney um, is the handle on Twitter. We'll be posting out pictures for a, I think it's going to be a two day smoke. We're going to put it on tonight, use some charcoal and a snake type of method to keep it going in the night, wake up at three in the morning and then, uh, restock and uh do the cooler method as well if you've never heard of the cooler method and we'll 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 have all sorts of great uh racing and uh brisket uh cooking going on on the twitter feeds you're making me you're making me hungry and yeah the cooler is just another way of crutching it and you don't if you're going as low and slow as you are you don't even need to crutch it in the oven it'll just maintain its heat if you wrap it and put it in the cooler I haven't done brisket all summer because we haven't had an oven. Uh, It's just one of those things. This is a measure of how insane it is in Saratoga. Got up here two months ago and the stove is working, but the oven isn't. And I just haven't had any time to deal with it or fix it. So we've had no oven all summer. And with the, for me, I'm a big relier on, I don't, the two days too ambitious for me. I like a good overnight cook, but I really do like to finish it with a crutch in the oven at, you know, 200 or whatever. And without that tool, without that crutch, as it were, I just don't trust myself to, to do it all on the heat and not ruin a beautiful piece of meat. So no brisket for me that I've made. Uh, we did some ribs though, and that was good. And we're looking forward to some really nice cooking here. It is just so beautiful in Saratoga this weekend. Now I say that and the rain will probably come in and it is forecast <laughs> to come in Sunday, Monday, but hoping for beautiful things and then hoping for more beautiful things in Toronto next weekend for the mile. Let me know if you're coming uh, by, if you're a regular listener, It'd be fun to meet up. I know we got a lot of people up in Toronto and I plan on being around the track plenty. So hopefully we'll get a chance to, to meet some more listeners. That's always a fun thing. Let's start off our analysis of this Woodbine Saturday card with race number four, because we've got, as I alluded to earlier, stakes action in the form of the Vice Region Stakes going five on the inner turf with an old favorite in here, Drew, in uh, in Silent Poet. But it's not, no layup. You do have a horse like Rock Crest who might be well suited by this inner turf configuration. Where are you going to go in here? Yeah, I think this is Silent Poet's race to lose, and I'm that's my top choice here. I think this this old hard knockers yet to really go five furlongs which i found surprising but i think the dependability and ability to break well and on top and stalk a lot of the speeds in here keep a length off and make that that ground saving and late move will be the winning factor so fair value to me feels like even money or maybe even a smidge below and at eight to five i'm not too mad about that price i will use for a Get a long shot backup. I think Forrester's fortune at six to one is going to be higher than that. Last year won well over this surface and has yet to get a similar setup than that on that day. So today looks to be uh, speed and, and and could clunk up into the frame with some of those other speeds going way too fast. And again, this one's going to be sitting back off the pace and will clunk right up. I think second or third place may be a victory, but I'm not holding my breath there. We'll use that one as a C. So A of the three and two as a C in this uh, stakes event to kick things off. All right. I like the sound of that. Let's move to another five furlong race on the inner turf. This one, though, for two-year-olds goes as race number six, and it is the the kickoff of the late pick four, and there's interconnecting uh, rolling doubles and, and pick threes as well for these Philly two-year-olds. You looking at one with experience here, or is your eye drawn to a first-time starter? I'm on the number eight film at three to one last out race that this one was in has produced some decent winners and uh, all those figures are coming back fairly strong. So I'm ignoring that figure that was quote unquote earned last out as, as the jockey threw in the towel to lose the battle, to win the war. And I think with a little improvement off the debut um, that we already saw third off the layoff should be perfect. And the cutback helps as well. So the number eight film for me, and then I'll use it as a backup, acquired taste at eight to one one of the three cassie runners in here 
I, Pete, I would love to be a part of the Cassie conversation in, in the paddock of what are the jockey instructions? Would really love to see it, but um, I, I'm hoping that this one is the speed here. Some recent bullet gate drill shows that this one may be just sending uh, loose for, for the Cassie and uh, Gabe Grossberg uh, connections here. So I'm on the eight and the two in this event here. Eight and two using them equally or one of, or is the two more of a backup? Backup on the two. All right. Sounds good. A couple of runners I wanted to mention. One you already touched on, and that's Film, who just looked to me an ideal candidate for the cutback. When you look at the pace figures in the middle of that race, I think the distance just you know took its toll after those exertions and just looks ideally suited to this. I also wanted to take a little bit of a shot with the four Lady Gabrielle based on some of the speed that, that she'd shown in those starts. Has been off for two months, but I think that Gail Cox will probably have this one ready and could end up being dangerous on the front end over the sharp five furlongs. So eight and four for me in this race. And with that, we'll pivot to race number seven, where we will find ourselves with more maidens, but these three and up fillies and mares. And this time we're going seven furlongs on the more galloping turf configuration where is your eye drawn yeah i love the number five quality collection here i tried to make my own morning lines on this one uh before seeing them and i had this runner like three to one ish and i think was finishing really well down the lane we've talked about it all the time on these airwaves that inner turf is not extremely suited for the galloping closer style as it were because of those tight turns and on that day on the debut uh, back on June 18th, uh, just a little bit too far behind the pace. And, and so stretching out to the seven furlongs and a little bit added time to train on uh, in Josie Carroll's hands, I trust with this one. And the morning line as a spoiler is 10 to one. So if we can see anything of that for the number five quality collection, holy smokes, that's going to be great. Uh, <laughs> the other man who's smoking all weekend. I like that. <laughs> yeah. That's the other thing is I start coughing like a smoker after uh, sm smoking meats all weekend, but we'll talk about that later. The, the other one I will use as a backup as well is the number three curling candy at nine to two gets the cut back and has plenty of speed and experience. Uh, it continues to show signs of improvement and gets the pickup of Emma Jane with the blinkers going on absolute loose leader candidate here to get the job done. So we'll be using that one as well. And, and I will be fading flywheel effect at two to one. I mean, it's just the narrative of like, why is Chad Brown and Claire shipping North can't be the top of the stock. Cause you got Kentucky downs going on right now. That's a big check they could pick up. Uh, and, and you've got Saratoga. So really curious why he's sending flywheel effect the number six to Woodbine. He uh, already sent one runner, uh, didn't do as, as great as hoped. And I think it's going to be just tremendously over bet. People are going to see Hernandez, they're going to see Brown, and then they're going to bet the crap out of it. So I'm fading flywheel effect, both on a value and of a handicapping principle standpoint. So the five and the three for me, five is an A, three is a B. I'm with you on the five quality collection. I wonder if we'll see that price that uh, was suggested um, by the morning line on this one. That was also a very nice form race with the top two uh, coming back to win. And I just think you hit on the key point. One looks like it may be a textbook case. I, I could see this as an example in a handicapping book or article at some point of one that just seems more suited to the, the outer turf at Woodbine than the inner turf. We'll see how it all plays out. Let's move to race number eight on the all weather optional claimers, fillies and mares. We're going a mile and 16th here. Drew, who do you like? Easy cold single number one rail horse. She makes a point and I'm making a point that this one's going to draw the rail. Uh, and just go at lone speed, overall best figure. So how about that for a, a cheesy pun in my, uh, I my, liked uh, it. No, we've got, we've got, we, we're making all kinds of, uh, we're making all kinds of points. Time form <laughs> has the five being able to hang with the one, but you, you don't okay. see it that way. I, I, I don't, I, I don't. And I think with some of these runners too, I, I, I just think there's only one way for she makes a point to go and that's forward. And if, if anything happens with the five, that's, that's great for us. And I'm just going to side with the fact that this, this horse has the best overall figures and, and is just going to carry on with it. So the one, she makes a point for me at this point. I was take, you can't stop with the point puns. I was going to take gal wonder 
as an alternative because I thought I'll wonder if the time form idea is right that uh, Biz, what is it, Busy Moline or Busy Moline? I'm probably butchering that name, but the five runner. Let me look at this closer. Busy Moline, I'm going with it. Can just keep she makes a point honest. I think Gal Wonder can sit in behind. I'm just one of these horses that has for me the right combination of speed and stamina. Stay in touch, stay right off the leaders, move on the turn, have enough finish. And this horse has, you know, good synth form from overseas. That was a, a fairly decent looking handicap, I think, that she was second in at Newcastle. So I'm I'm interested in Gal Wonder to get the job done. And we may have our head to head right here. What do you think? Yeah, I like it. I like it. And, and the other thing with uh, Busy Moline, yeah, may, may be able to go with uh, She Makes a Point, but I, I just don't see it in the figures that um, this one's going to be a present enough to change the pace dynamic. One, one thing I try and look at is, is it going to impede the runner that I like? So in other words, is Busy Moline going to be pushing the whole way? And I just, I just don't see it. Could it happen? Absolutely. But I think I think the instructions are going to be take back, sit off the hip, and try and make the run late. And I'm trusting that she makes a point. It's just going to be able to outfinish at the end. All right. We'll see how it plays out on track. We go now to the last race at Woodbine on Saturday, race number nine, quarter claimers, three and up, going seven furlongs on the turf. And these late exotics, these late horizontal exotics, Drew, how are we getting paid? Yeah, I'm on the uh, a couple horses, a little spready here across three. We're going to go with the number six analyzer at seven to two. I think showed some really nice speed last out and gets a jockey upgrade today with the trainer switch. A couple strong workouts since that trainer switch. And wouldn't mind to see this one just go gate to wire uh, as well. The other ones we're going to be on is the number four, create again, five to one. I, I showed can run over the turf course and gets the third start off the li- uh, layoff. The wider course may favor the stalker who will be pressing that pace from one to two lengths off. And I think that's really where you want your runners to be in this race here is not too far back. There looks to be some serious closers. And speaking of uh, an- another old favorite of the podcast here, the number nine Lapachka at six to one, another presser type who could be in the thick of things um, last out horrendous ground loss um, over the distance with the surface. So with a little bit better race luck, not out of the, out of the frame. So the six, the four, and the nine, and I will use more as a emotional hedge with the number eight Mambo in the force at 20 to one. <laughs> I think Jeff Pratt's been quoted in saying this. I just can't not bet some of these longer shot horses that I've been chasing because the day I leave them off the ticket, they're going to come through. So <laughs> um, I'm just playing that this one can get back to the older form, needs a bit of a setup um, for everything to go right, but you'll get paid if that happens. So uh, the A line, six, four, nine, and a backup with the eight in this. In the All right. Nightcap. I like the sound of it. There's another podcast old favorite. I'm surprised you didn't mention who I'm going to use as a backup. I'm with you at the top of the ticket. I wasn't sure. I don't think we saw the race exactly the same. I'm not sure if analyzers going to be able to make the lead off the claim, but I do think we'll be in positive position. Tough old horse. First off the claim for McKnight, a game that he obviously plays very well. I, I think that analyzer looks like, potentially the right horse in the spot but the old favorite that i wanted to throw in there for for just a mention at least is number one time skip probably more for underneath but at 12 to 1 i could see king this horse underneath he is not exactly a winning kind as the 43 starts four wins seven seconds and 12 thirds suggest but i just this is a horse i've, I've kind of always liked and I, I don't know. The last race to me just wasn't just wasn't that bad. And I think getting back onto the turf against lesser the last turf race was against much, much better. I think time skip can hit the frame at the price and I'll use for a penny on top as well. What do you think of time skipping here? Any shot? Yeah, I'm looking. The more I look at it, blinkers go back on and maybe that wakes this one up. We are also getting a jockey change um, back over to Stein. And he's a, he's been riding pretty well lately. So that may also make sure that this runner that doesn't get too far behind early and leave too much to do late. All right. You and I have to have an, uh, an, an off 
air production meeting where we talk about all the fun stuff we're going to do next week for Toronto. I'm really excited, really excited, as I've said many times, to be heading back up there. But we, we don't need to we don't need to bore the people with that. Um, we will talk about that. I, I say that out loud, though, just so we remember to do it early in the week. Um, and hopefully we can catch up with Jim Lawson early in the week as well. It'll be, be a lot of fun. And, yeah, so we'll be seeing plenty from you next week. And we'll be talking soon. Drew, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. And the helicopter will land right here if you need a spot. If we're going up to Toronto, we're close to the border as it is, only a couple hours away. So I'll you be waiting back back. Seriously, you should come. We'll talk about it off air. Let's talk soon, man. Cheers. Fixed odds betting powered by BetMakers is back and in effect at Monmouth Park, and the early returns are fantastic. 70% of winners paying more on fixed odds than they are on the tote. Fixed odds wagering is now available throughout the state. This is an exciting new way to bet that really puts the power to get value in your hands because the odds you bet are the odds you get. You're going to be hearing a lot more about fixed odds betting opportunities across the In The Money Media Network. Now it's time to bring in our usual panel to talk about Monmouth Park Saturday racing. From the bet makers, we will first introduce Dallas Baker. Dallas, how are things? Peter, going good. Thank you for having us again. And uh, in that lower portion of the screen, rocking that Astros hat, we got to get the full-on jersey. We we had audio only the other day, and he had a, a resplendent Astros jersey. We'll have to we'll, we'll bring that back at some stage, of course, from InTheMoneyPodcast.com. Nick Tamaro, Nick, what's up? I'm doing great, Pete. And unfortunately, it's Friday, and they're not delivered yet. But we're having our fantasy football draft on Sunday, and the goal is to wear a jersey. And so my wife, luckily, is going to get the Warren Moon Vintage Oilers jersey because they didn't have my size. So, you know, it's one of the disadvantages of having a little extra flesh. But um, I had the high, wide, and handsome uh, problem. <laughs> problem. But uh, I will have Lawrence Taylor in the house, so that's good enough. So Very that, good. I mean, there's, th- th- that's, my, that's my favorite. And I still yeah. somehow barely fit into my 80s Lawrence Taylor jersey. I mean, it's it's gone from being baggy to skin tight, but I can get into the thing I, I wore well, when I was 100. Well, well, skin tight was big in the 80s, though, so Pete. So <laughs> you just, a lot of bare midriff back then. The, the used to catch up to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ridiculous. Speaking of high, wide, and handsome, let's take a look at uh, some of these markets. We'll see if that definition applies. We're going to go over the, the prices and some ideas for the win early pick five, which will be... Once again, I don't think it's – we're not going to be the the nation's earliest pick five with the Saratoga early start time, but it is a very early pick five. It starts at 12.15 Eastern. Great way to uh, get stuck in, whether you're attending the races at Monmouth or betting simulcast. And if you're looking at Saratoga, I keep saying this, but I really believe it. With as much time as there is between races at Saratoga, you've got to be looking at some some other stuff. And, you know, our other partner tracks of Monmouth at the top of the list are places I think you should be looking. We kick things off at 12.15 with race number one for two-year-old maidens going one mile on the turf. We'll start with you, Dallas. How are you going to price this one up? We've got a morning line favorite at five to two in networking. Are you similar? Well, actually pretty similar across the board to the morning line here, Pete, actually just glancing across the two. Yeah, networking is our favorite, same as the morning line, five to two or $3.50 decimal. Ahead of Shea on the lamb uh, at three to one, four dollars decimal, same as the morning line. Uh, slight difference with Harbour Moon, but not much. Five to one, as is Trophy Room. But yep, networking with who I believe the best rider at Monmouth Park is in Hiro Rendon. Uh, riding that to start the day, networking five to two favourite in the first. What are you going to do in your win early pick five, Nick? How are we going to light this candle? Yeah, you know, there's not a lot of turf pedigree to go on amongst the horses that haven't been on the lawn yet. And so you're kind of wanting to just take networking, hoping that he's figuring it out start by start. He's a, a sibling of Force the Pass who won the Belmont Derby years ago, and he got a little bit better as time went by. He also showed quite a bit more in his first two starts than this son of Spitestown has. Shea on the Lamb is going to get some support simply because of the uh, the high percentage connections, and I think Brad Thomas put a little bit of extra extra oomph into that line and putting him down to 3-1 to one, because he really didn't do any running on, in debut. He did break slowly, now gets LASIK, so there's reason to believe he can improve. There's a smidge of turf pedigree in the second family, not very much. I think you just try and keep it simple. I'm going to use a networking, and I'm going to use the three and four as backups. There's also a little bit of turf pedigree on summer beat. Six on the top line with three and four on the backup line in the first race at Monmouth for Nick. Let's pivot to the back half of this early double. 
where we've got a starter allowance for three and up going a mile 70 on the dirt and a field of seven going postward, uh, including a few familiar names. Nick, how you want to get through this leg? I mean, Coach Adams is clearly the horse to beat here. He had the misfortune of running into no salt last time out. And I think that Angel Rodriguez did what he had to do in terms of staying close early. And ultimately, he paid the price for it coming up a little bit short late. No salt came right back and won. That's a runner that we've seen do quite well over time for a couple of different barns. Now in the care of Scott Volk, who's made a bit of a comeback. He might only have one horse, but he's run well three times since he got the uh, the, the runner into his barn. Pace-wise, this is a huge setup for Coach Adams. I think he's alone. A, I respect friendly fella from the barn of Claudio Gonzalez, who, of course, has been going tremendously well lately. Uh, he'll get plenty of support at the windows. I just think when push comes to shove, Coach Adams is a bit better horse. My off-the-wall long shot that uh, you could throw in maybe as a, a backup backup is invest for Lolita Shivmongol coming down from New York. This horse is going to be a big price, deservedly so. Buried on the inside last time out on a day at Saratoga where you probably wanted to lose a little ground to find the best path. Very interesting. Very curious to hear how you're pricing this one up, Dallas, because we've talked about you needing to have a little extra enthusiasm sometimes with some of these Carlos Gonzalez runners. Coach Adams on the morning line, 6-5, to five, friendly fella, 9-5. to five. How do you have it? Yeah, we'll go up odds on Coach Adams. I'd say Peter, $1.80 or $4 to 5 in uh, fractional language. Ahead of Claudio, $2.80. But I, Nick, I want to ask you about Claudio because we saw probably up until, say, two, three weeks ago that everything that was backed with Claudio, you might as well just write the results in the in the book. You don't even have to watch the race. You know what's going to happen. Uh, Rojas is going to be signing autographs as he's coming down, winning by five lengths. Um, but we've seen in the last couple of weeks, these horses have still been backed. But a couple of them have not even really got to the bend. Um, so there's sort of the, there was the the absolute unbeatable feel to anything that was back from Claudio three weeks ago to now that feeling like from a, from a managing the book side of thing that you've got a chance. And a lot of the times the chances have been, uh, you know, put down the glasses turning for home. Um, have you seen, you know, any patterns in that or any read on that, Nick? Yeah, I mean, with his volume of starters, you're going to have some ebbs and flows. And I think he got into that really big run back in July, you know, early to mid-July that kind of carried all the way into August. The problem is that, you know, we our races have so many conditions that your horses run out of conditions at a period of time. Mm. And the races that are filling, you know, for example, Friendly Fella is a horse who essentially has been running in the same condition for his last two starts and now runs in the exact same condition again. These don't always fill. Right. And so if you've got to move this horse up a condition off of that race, he's going to be facing substantially better horses. And I think he's run into a little bit of that. You know, I think he's a guy that also has fallen on the, the right side of variance at this point. So that's why you're getting back to that standard yeah, like, yeah. of him yeah. of 20. Right. Felt like he was winning at about an 80 percent clip for a while. <laughs> especially the- <laughs> I, I felt like he was winning at 200 <laughs> percent. It was like a fait accompli when we put the odds up. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Nick Claudio one to five. Yeah, but just more, <laughs> just more reality catching up with life, really. Is that what you're saying, Nick? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think just uh, reversion to the mean. Yep. Yeah, and you throw right. that in with that great point about conditions, and you, you can see how there are some other factors other than just the randomness. You put the two together, yeah. and it's easy to cool off any hot streak. Yeah. It, make, it makes total sense because I think when his horses were unbeatable, they were just perfectly placed, and now right. they're probably not as perfectly placed, as you said, due to running out of conditions. Anyway, interesting. Let's move on to the hinge of this win early pick five. It's race number three, claiming race 7,500, Phillies and Mares three and up, going five and a half on the dirt. We'll start with you, Dallas. How did you price this one up? Yeah, it's close to the Dick Tabarro high wide at Hanson. It's, uh, yeah, pretty competitive at the top of the market here. Mizzen, two to one favor or $3 fractional, uh, roughly five to two, a little bit of a roll over at $3.60 for Leviosa. Down the bottom to Bah Bahama Pearl at three to, three to one or $4. And then... Five dollars or four to one for Love's Mystery, Love's Misery, I should say, and Empire G, five dollars and fifty cents or nine to two. So as you can see, Pete, uh, there you can throw a blanket over the top end of the market there. I think your optimistic view of life came in play in that Freudian slip there. Love's a mystery instead of Love's Misery, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't worry, I'm used to misery, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> you use the term about you, rolling. You, you, you want to dedicate a show to life's miseries? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, yeah, that's definitely a topic for another podcast. You used a, a bookmaking a term there, or at least a, a little bit of an insidery term. I wanted to stop and explore for one second there, We're talking about a price rolling over. What does that mean? Yeah, rolling. So basically, it's just the next. Uh, it, that actually does go back to the traditional fractional markets uh, where the rolls are. So, you know, I mean, 
you know, I, I've got the, uh, I, I, as I've said many a times before, and obviously we talk in decimals, but being a bit nostalgic and all of that, I'm, I much prefer the fractional language. And but the fractional to fractional actually does serve a purpose because it's a mathematical role based on percentages as you roll through the numbers. So um, in my language in Australia, there's there's probably more roles than there are is in the US fractional market. So something to make it easy, like if it was US, it's two to one to five to two. So um, you know, two to one moving out to five to two is a roll of the board. So literally the old bookmakers board, when you would roll the numbers, the next number would come up would be five to two. So hence it's why it's a roll. But in decimal language, it's sort of bastardizing the old fractional fractional terms to a degree. So a roll becomes three dollars fifty to three dollars sixty. So it's the yeah, next we, very it's similar next to number. how we use like tick, you know, a tick above you'll we'll Yeah, a tick above, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's just it's just the next number in the sequence of the numbers rolling out, how the how the odds are displayed. Nick, what numbers will be on our win early pick five tickets in race number three? You know, we've heard Dallas talk about the success that uh, some of the punters have had with uh, Juan Avila. And I think that the pricing that uh, is going to go up there is going to reflect that. You know, it's a little bit like I I was talking to our esteemed friend Philly Joe last week about how the bookmakers around Philadelphia price the Eagles on the money line every week. And they're about a dollar lower than they are anywhere else. So you got to know what the locals are going to do. And you got to bake that into your pricing a bit. And I think a little bit of that's been done here. I thought Leviosa was going to wire this field. I think she's uh, she's plenty quick. And since Jesus Cruz got her last time, he dropped her down in class. I mean, there's just not much you can say about how significant the drop from 25 in New York down to a $7,500 beaten claimer in New Jersey is. And she's able to stay at that level being a three-year-old. I thought she'd be very dangerous to make it two in a row. And I was just going to make her a lone A, um, using Mizzen as a backup, respecting Juan Avila quite a bit. And, uh, and I would put Love's Misery in there as well. I'm still young and foolish enough to think that Love isn't quite all that miserable. <laughs> <laughs> what are those numbers? So the one is the A and what were the Bs again? The one is the A and two and four is backups. Two and four to back up. I have a strange setup today for reasons I won't bore you with. So it's uh, keeping track of things a little trickier than it is usually for me. Let's talk about race number four, this $12,000 claiming event going a mile and 70 on the dirt. Nick, we'll keep it with you. Yeah, this is a really tough leg, and I think one where you're going to want to be. I've been pretty pretty narrow in terms of uh, the top slots. I thought this was a tough race, and, you know, it's an interesting race because from a, a betting perspective, you have a horse like Lord Jackson who ran a race two starts back that, quite honestly, if he duplicates it, he's going to win. But he has that bad running line. And so the public bets the last running line very heavily, I think, whether it's in a fixed odds market or paramutual. And so I think you're going to get a better price on him than you probably should. Claudio Gonzalez, as I'm not slow, is uh, is very nicely named and uh, and is a horse, I think, who comes in with plenty of win credentials as well, has a good bit of speed and should stay close. But you've got these couple of New York invaders in 63S and Uncle Waterflow, and collectively they come from two trainers that hit at about a 5% clip um, over the last five years. So, you know, you wonder if going down to AAA, so to speak, is going to get the job done for both of them. Uncle Waterflow's last race was plenty good enough to win this. And I think that they're being uh, pretty shrewd in terms of spotting him in a two-life event in Jersey where he can be successful. Unlikely this horse is going to win a New York bred race in the claiming ranks. I'm going to throw a blanket over the four of them and use all four. Two, four, five, six. I'll back up a little bit with the three. Um, I, I see one of those horses likely getting the job done. And I don't want to split hairs terribly much on what could be the, the principles in the race. And when you have a ticket as narrow as you do elsewhere, you can get away with that. Right. How these? How do these uh, four and the rest look in the market, Dallas? Yeah, again, you know, I think the way the Nick surmised it is pretty close to the market. Um, I'm not slow for Claudio, as we mentioned before, $2.80 in favourite. Ahead of uh, Lord Jackson, 5 to 2 $3.50, 7 to 2 or $4.50 for Uncle Waterflow. And Hur- uh, Murray came down the bottom, $5.50 or 9 to 2 And the other one Nick mentioned, 63S, around about the 10 to 1 mark. Race number five is our featured race of the day. We've got the Violet Stakes going a mile and a 16th on the turf for Phillies and Mares, three-year-olds and up with 100,000 in the pot on the morning line. Vigilante's way, a solid three to two favorite for Paco and Shug McGahee. What are you doing with that one in the fixed odds market? <laughs> if you can get three to two, go and take it, Pete. It'll start odds on. Uh, $1.80 we've got at the moment. And I, I don't know, Nick, I think that's pretty generous as well too. 
Um, that's favourite ahead of Flighty Lady at five to two, three dollars and fifty cents. Nine to two or five dollars fifty for Star Seeking Number One. And next in the market is Runaway Rumor at six to one. Nick, as it pertains to our win early pick five at Monmouth on Saturday, how are we getting paid? Yeah, I mean, Vigilante's way should be all you need. She's really run well enough in all three starts this year to have won one of them, but simply has come up short. I guess from a betting perspective, Chad is sort of your protection from Vigilante's way drifting down even more. But yeah, as Dallas alluded to, you're probably going to be looking at the end of the day at about one to two or three to five in on the tote board for, uh, for Vigilante's way. And, and I can imagine that the the happy folks at betmakers are not going to be willing to, to have somebody come along at four to five and make a huge bet. At least not two of them. The problem is there's just no balance. We'll let one on. <laughs> right. You'll let, you'll let a couple. Um, you know, there's no balance in the field. Like The other five horses look like they are completely overmatched. And flighty lady, when push comes to shove, really isn't that good. So for me in the pick five, I mean, I would, for every five units I have vigilante's way, I'd have one on flighty lady. So obviously this is a scenario where in the pick five, you know, I'm basically playing two by one by one by four by one. You know, that's one where you'd play that main ticket, however many units you play it for. When you back up with a horse like Flighty Lady, you would do it with roughly one fifth of it. I think that that it's safe to say Vigilante's way, in my opinion, is four to five times more likely to win this race than anybody else. Good stuff, guys. We're going to actually make a little segue to our next segment. We may have a commercial in between. We'll, we'll have to see how it all uh, shakes out. But I did, Dallas, want to give you a chance to comment on the Kentucky Downs meet, where I know Betmakers is involved, sponsoring a day, helping with the morning line, controlling some international rights. Uh, what, what did you think of opening day? What are you looking forward to a weekend it, down there? It, it, isn't it great? It, you, you just turn on the TV and you smile, don't you, when you see Kentucky Downs? It's just such a such a unique venue. And uh, Carter Carnegie and Ted Nicholson have just done such a amazing job to think, you know, where it has come to in such a short time. And, you know, for, as we pontificate about what the opportunities lie for the racing industry, it just goes to show how quickly something can go from zero to redlining maximum awesome in a pretty short period of time. What are we talking, 10, 15 years, if, if that? Um, you know, so, yeah, really looking forward to getting down there. The Betmakers Day is Thursday next week. I think that's the 8th. And then, obviously, that leads into the the huge weekend there on the, the, the absolute stellar day on the Saturday. But... Yeah, great racing, great start to Kentucky Downs. Uh, uh, yeah, the morning line looked to looked to find some pretty good prices. Actually, if you're using the morning line to bet off yesterday, you would have had, I think, you would have had a pretty decent day. So that was that that came across very well. So yeah, no, very, very proud to be um, partnering up as we are with uh, Kentucky Downs, as we are with Monmouth and all of our partner tracks. So um, they're great, they're progressive, and it's just uh, yeah, it's just a fun place to bet. Great stuff, Nick Dallas. We'll see you both soon. See you guys. Thanks. They say horsemen, handicappers, and racing fans won't want to miss a single day of the seven day fan duel meet at Kentucky Downs in early September. Owners and trainers will compete for the world's richest overnight purses, and horse players will enjoy the best betting opportunities in America with large fields and low takeout. Thanks to the Kentucky Thoroughbred Development Fund, registered Kentucky breads will run for $150,000 in maiden races with allowance races starting at $160,000. The 17 stakes totaling $10.7 million include eight graded stakes. Remaining Kentucky Downs race dates are September 3rd, 4th, 8th, 10th, 11th, and 14th. Mark your calendars, and we're going to have coverage of every one right here on the In The Money Media Network in print and in podcast reserved seats are on sale now at kentuckydowns.com there's unique and then there's kentucky downs next up our ongoing coverage of this kentucky downs meet we're going to be taking a look at the last four races of the saturday card and to do so we have two guests that you've heard frequently on these airwaves especially lately we'll start off uh, with the man on the top of the screen who we've been very eager to get on here to talk about Kentucky Downs from a statistical perspective, given the fact that he is a race lens power user. He is also a successful contest player, all around good horse player and guest. He's Matt Vac Volgi. Matt, what's up? Not much, Pete. It's, uh, you know, it's going to be a nice long weekend, hopefully. Hopefully the, the uh, rain stays away. That doesn't look great in the Saratoga area, but, uh, you know, the last hurrah for the spa. So uh, we'll we'll take our shots there, but uh, got to look elsewhere too. And, and uh, Kentucky Downs is certainly a place to, uh, to fire some bullets and get some uh, get some good prices. It's a loaded weekend of racing. And the next man I'm going to bring on, we've been talking a lot in the context of the open stable, 
project, the jocks room, the uh, the epicenter NFT. But as we've mentioned, he's also uh, very much at the center of BBN Racing, Big Blue Nation. And he was fantastic on our Kentucky Downs preview show. And since no good deed goes unpunished around here, we had to have him on to handicap some specific races. He's Brian Klatsky. Brian, what's up? Hey, Pete, how you doing? Where are you going to be this weekend? Are you going to be at Kentucky Downs? You're coming back to Saratoga? Where, where's the well, I sweated it out opening day at Kentucky Downs yesterday, to, uh, you know, up close and personal. Uh, it was hot. Um, but uh, it, uh, I'll tell you, first day is always the best day to observe and, and start identifying the track and the trends. And unfortunately, I, I invested too much early. Um, I should have saved more of a bankroll going into next week. I, did, I didn't listen to my own advice, but um, <laughs> I do. I, there are a few takeaways from day one that uh, will help over the weekend. Let's start there. I mean, you and Mo- Mike Maloney had said, look for the hot jockey. Tyler Gaffleone stamped himself as that right away in the first four races. What are some other things that uh, you took away from day one? You know, I, I think the biggest takeaway was that you can't throw out any horse. Um there is definitely horse for the course um, lives very large here. Uh, you cannot assume that anybody is out. Uh, even if a horse hasn't been over the track before, they can show up and like it. So I've started to really focus on the try box all where I, you know, I, I take two and use the field. Uh, I think you're going to find, you look at every race, it, the tote board doesn't indicate anything and you will always find value. So if you can identify two um, to play in a try box all, um, and then use that, you know, use that wheel in any position. It, it, it's the, it's the right play. And for, you know, it's a hundred and two, you know, for a dollar, $2 bet, you, you know, you can spread it pretty good for, um, you know, anywhere between 96 and $120. Matt, how about you? Any takeaways from opening day or angles you're particularly excited about betting generally at this Kentucky Downs meet before we drill down into the specifics? Yeah, I, I think the um, I think the jockey angle is big with me. Uh, just given the, um, the 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 way the course is laid out, I think this is certainly a course where you want you just you want jockeys that are confident to ride certain certain distances. Uh, just the way that the course undulates and, and and goes out, you know, I think the 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 jockey angle to me is something to watch. Um, in terms of like track profiles, it's very difficult. Um, this is probably I would say the most difficult track to profile out of any track that I look at all, all year long. And I think it has to do with the way the course is set up. It also has to do when they start moving, uh, start moving the fence. If weather comes in, you see some crazy, crazy changes. So uh, in terms of track profiling, I, I try to stay away from it a little bit and look more to the specifics, looking more towards the trainer, uh, looking more towards uh, uh, jockey specifics to, uh, to, to build plays. And the good thing about a program like Race Lens is, even though normally you really try to rely on that profile stuff, there's a lot of other clubs in the bag, as it were, that can still help you try to get an edge at a place like Kentucky Downs. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's it's, it's the follow along, right? So it's not like I don't build those basic, I build those all those basic angles, pace angles, early pace, late pace, post position, and you follow along, right? You follow along to see how they're doing and if there's any trends that I can catch early enough before the public does and, and start to try to, to build those into uh, to your plays. Um, but it's just, it's one of those where I do have to like pull back and say, okay, you can't really look at a specific track profile to start because you want to see how this track plays. because it, 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 can, it can play completely different uh, day by day. Got to be nimble. Let's start with race number eight. This is the second of the two-year-old stakes. This is the Kentucky Downs Juvenile Mile uh, for with 500,000 in the pot obviously for the two-year-olds. Brian, we'll bring you back in to get your thought on this one. Where's your eye drawn? My eye drawn is number seven labor here. Um, I'm going with the maiden in this spot. Um, I know this family really well. Uh, This is a half to Navratilova, um, who was a a really nice two-year-old on turf. Um, You know, center court was a multiple grade stakes winner on turf. That was a winning race at Ellis. If you look at the line here, um, and for Rusty, uh, first time out, he generally has him maybe 75, 80% fit, doesn't have him cranked. Um, I think he shows the confidence to come back in this spot. And um, he's not he, he he's not here just to get a you know VIP tickets in the tent. He's here to win the race. So at that price, 12 to 1, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna use labor um all throughout exotics and on top. 
I love the tennis themed names. I was a Navratilova fan. I think that was a, was that two year old race at Del Mar in, in, in just the last couple of years, definitely pedigree, definitely a good angle with the connections and certainly see those uh, rusty Arnold runners just keep getting better with experience. And this one should be a, a strong price being a maiden in a $500,000 stakes race. Anything you wanted to go with Brian, or is it really just all about labor for you here? I mean, I'm, I'm going to, I'm playing all the way around, but you know, to use it, I mean, obviously Mike Maker's horse coming from Saratoga um, is interesting. What I like about what Mike Maker did with this horse is he shipped down to the, uh, you know, to Kentucky to get a race. And I think it's a hard ship to go 13 hours into the heat of Kentucky downs. If you're leaving, you know, Saratoga one or two days prior to the race. So I think Mike Maker had this, um, this race circled the minute they won in Saratoga in July 23rd. So you know, there's some chalk there, but you know, the, you know, to keep, you know, like I said, getting back to my try box, all play the four, seven, all, and hope for anybody else to fill out that try. And you're probably looking at a real nice ticket. And you can wheel it through too. I mean, I always love when you have that double key idea four, seven with all with four, seven as well. If, as we discussed, one of the rare places, Kentucky downs, where we don't, our, our teeth don't itch when we talk about the all button, Matt, let's bring you in for your thought on race eight. I uh, went a you know a little bit of a different direction, but uh, four two three uh, for me, um, you know the four really good. I thought was uh, was really good first out. Um, you know got a nice setup. I don't know if that uh, that slow start was the reason for the success in that race. So I guess got to take a little bit of a pause. Totally different world at uh, at Kentucky Downs, uh, but that's one I, I think is going to be closer to the pace. Going to be going to be up front. Um, so we'll, we'll see if we can uh, get a, get a good speed horse to carry, um, the number two, uh, Bramble blaze, um, from the clouds at, uh, at Monmouth at the time, a track that was not playing well off the pace either speed was really carrying at that particular time at Monmouth. So, uh, I think it's going to get a nice pace to run into does have the, uh, top Equibase lay pace figure they can find over at, uh, true odds. Um, so I like this horse off the pace, uh, you know, Looking at uh, Dini's second career start uh, without blinkers, does have a positive 3% ROI here out of 66 starts. Um, and then I'll throw the three uh, Mayfield Strong third career starts uh, off a win last out. Really looking at uh, McPeak with some nice numbers. Um, $3.10 ROI with Lannery, 19% uh, wins off a win and 22% wins for the year in stakes. So uh, just some nice numbers there to round out uh, uh, Mayfield Strong. But I'm going to go with uh, four two as A's and the threes as a, B, as a B. All right, let's move to race number nine. We've got an allowance race for Phillies and Mares three and up, going six and a half on the turf. Matt, we'll keep it with you. Uh, so uh, I kind of bounce back and forth from a few horses here, but I'll, I'll kind of I'll narrow it down to, to two, uh, the 12 touch of class and uh, the 11 uh Nota Benning, is that how you say it? Um, those two is, is who I'll go with here. Uh, touch of class, uh, third off the layoff, I thought was much better effort uh, last out. Um, I like this horse drawn to the outside. Uh, should get a nice stalking trip uh, in, in this race. And I think six and a half is perfect distance for this horse. So, uh, you know, based on the run style, and then also looking at, you look at Flint uh, <laughs> route to sprint, you know, 20% winners with a very nice uh, $3.84 ROI. Uh, and also 28% in allowance company as well. So some strong numbers there. Uh, Nota Bene, uh, the 11, um, off the pace, you know, gets the top Equibase late pace figure. Uh, the only horse in the race to have a triple digit late pace figure with some speed in this race. So I certainly do. I certainly do like that. Um, you know, nice win last out at Saratoga. I, I think we'll have a nice pace to run into and uh, should be tough to, uh, should be tough late. I could see the trip working out for sure in a race that time form also projects as having plenty of early speed. Brian, let's bring you back in. Uh, Matt's obviously all about the high numbers here, 11 and 12. Where are you? Well, just to reiterate the high numbers, I do think that this is one of the few tracks where post doesn't matter. You know, I'm not, I'm not scared of, you know, 12, 13, you know, we've seen that yesterday. So for me, the 12 is, is my key in the race. Um, you know, I love that race last year over the course. Um, and then what I, what I really like um, for value in this race to go with the 12, you know, I come back to the, uh, to the three, Paul Lobo. I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this, Madralina, um, this five-year-old mare. 
you know, interesting. I, I love second race here off the layoff with Corrales, that turf race, um, it's last race in Argentina. You know, obviously the form over there, we can't make much of it, but, you know, obviously the horses run both turf and dirt. And, you know, Paul Lobo, you know, last year at Kentucky Downs in love really, you know, came, you know, came alive. And I think he knows how to prepare a horse for this course. So if I can get a nice price with Corrales on the three, use it with the 12. That's how I'm looking at this race. I like it. Let's move on to race number 10. Graded stakes action here for the grade three Windstar Mint Million. Three and up going a mile. Man, the purse is here incredible. The, the field size is impressive. Here we've got a field of nine. Brian, who's your idea of the winner? All right. You know, I'm biased, I'm very opinionated on this race. There's a long story to tell here on Kentucky Ghost. Um, obviously, we, 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 we've we thought very highly of this horse, bringing him back this year. Uh, entered him at Keeneland, allowance race, did not draw in. So we came out at Churchill in that in the, in the turf classic grade one for a million, and Rafi pulled him up two steps into the race was sinking down to the bottom. Rafi felt uncomfortable and, you know, you always err on the side of caution. And, you know, really at the time we may have had a new, a few expellatives to, (laughs) but Rafi did the right thing. You know, it was a precautionary van off. We went over him head to toe. There was nothing wrong with him. Just that, you know, the turf hadn't grown in yet. Everybody was struggling and slipping on it. And Rafi, you know, says, you know what, I'm not, I did, did the right thing. And in racing today, we always want to err on the side of caution. So, you know, Vicky got, got, got him back. Breeze stayed vet. Everything was great. Shipped up to Monmouth and, and had the perfect, um, you know, had the perfect, really his first race of the year, you know, was, was that race at the cliffhanger. The UN was a free entry out of the cliffhanger. We had our concerns about three turns. If you notice last year, we ran them in the, um, we were off of the TVG. We came to Keeneland. We ran him off a short rest back in the Sycamore. We threw that allowance race in the middle. We didn't know if he was a little tired, if it was the three turns. Looking back now, it was the three turns. He actually stopped running in the UN after the second turn in confusion, and then Giroux got him going again. And if you look, he made a really big move down the stretch once he realized, hey, there's a, there's more to go here. Um and, you know, Gufo was, what, a, ha- a neck, a, ha- a half a length from him in that race. So we said, let's get, let's get him right for Kentucky Downs. We know where he likes it down there. This is his third, third year there, second both times. So he's going into this race as good as we can have him, you know, really as a fresh legs coming into this year. We would have run him more, but it was really just circumstances. Didn't get in at Keeneland, you know, pulled up at Churchill. So you're talking about a, a live, fresh horse here. And I know the guys in the form are picking him. I want to keep that six to one, eight to one alive, but he may trickle down to seven to two, three to one. I don't know. But, you know, I we, we've run against all these horses. I know them all really well. Um, you can make a case for anybody to run in here with him. So, um I'm just keying in on Kentucky Ghost, and uh, no one in the field would surprise me filling this out, um, however it's run. Godspeed. It it's really seems like a great spot. Am I right that there's a logic to the idea that the same horse that wouldn't like three turns might really like the galloping configuration at Kentucky Downs? No, it's 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 a it's a it's a great assumption. You know, uh, he's shown us the last two years. I mean, in love. You know, he was all out with In Love last year. And, you know, In Love goes on to win the grade one at Keeneland off that race. Um, cavalry charge beat him by a neck, at, you know, next out at uh, in the allowance at Keeneland. So this is a group where, you know, he beat Pixel 8 um, at Colonial Downs last summer. It, it's, you know, it's it's unbelievable how it's, uh, it's, it's the same group. And to be honest with you, for a million, um, we've been running to Chad Brown a lot this summer. And to be able to get down the Kentucky Downs for a million without Chad Brown in the race was um, was a pleasant <laughs> surprise. <laughs> Matt, let's bring you in for – I totally buy the case, and I'm on Kentucky Ghost right with you. But I will still say, Matt, we'll bring you in for a slightly more uh, objective take on the man. <laughs> wish, all, wish all the luck. Like, you, you're right, though, Brian. I mean, I, I can see – a lot of different horses uh, winning in this race. Uh, it is difficult. And of course, in that case, I'm going to try to single. So <laughs> I'm going to try to go to the number nine atone. And uh, I just think it's going to get a perfect trip. I just, uh, my pace figures are in line with time form. I think there's going to be a scramble for the lead in terms of, of the early pace. 
And I think you can see Atone sitting just in a perfect spot, just letting that duel play out uh, in front. And I think it's been running it, running it's much better. I think it's, it's, it's perfectly spotted for this race. Um, you know, Maker's numbers been getting a little bit better. Pete, you know, I like kind of the recency uh, bias when it comes to uh, jockeys and trainers. It just, I think it exudes confidence and something that's not baked into the, uh, to the long-term numbers. Uh, so I think Atone is going to get a, a very nice trip and I, and I think it's going to be really tough in here. I also, I do think Pixelate is the horse to beat. Um, I'm just not going to get defensive there. I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to try to single here and get Atone home. Uh, I would love that uh, seven to two, I believe was the morning line. Uh, we'll see. I think, it's a, I think this board's going to be very interesting to see when it opens up. Cause I think pretty much any horse uh, has a shot in here. Really psyched to see this one. I mean, hopefully folks are going to be stuck in for the whole Kentucky Downs card. But if you want to set your alarm for this one, 6.30 on Saturday night, definitely be uh, in, in, rooting for Brian and the BBN team. I, I, will, I will tell you, Matt, um, when Mike Maker scratched the tone out of the, t you know, out of the 400 yesterday to come back here, I did, I did not like that. Um, <laughs> and, and it's a great point, right? You make a couple of great points. Number one there, yes. I, I love to see that move to say, nope, we're gonna spot this horse. And I think he does a great job of spotting his horses uh where where you know where he feels gonna run best. But Ryan, you made a great point about just going back to uh to the to the prior race of don't be afraid of the outside when it comes to sprints. Like the traditional, like I just want to emphasize that point because like like Santa Anita, Saratoga, I mean it's almost like a blind throw out. When you have those, so the numbers are just atrocious. But for for Kentucky Downs, Brian, you make a great point. Do not throw those horses out just the way this course plays. Let's go to race number eleven. We just have a couple minutes left to talk about this hundred and fifty thousand dollar maiden special weight for fillies and mares, three and up, going a mile on the turf. Brian, if one, if we're playing this late pick four, how are we getting paid? Uh, this is getting close to the all button here. <laughs> um, this is for the pick four. I mean. This this is a this is a this is a um, this is a tough one. I mean, I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Maker here. Um, I like the six. I like the I like the move to turf here. Um, I think if I had to, if you had to, you know, hold a gun to my head, that's where I think he moves up. You know, Mike knows what he's doing. He's just not coming out here and, and running them for exercise. He's coming to win. Um, to me, the, the six is the value in the race. Um, I'll lean on Matt to, to extend this, but, um, you know, obviously, I, you know, I, I think Rusty's in with a shot too as an outside fit, you know, at seven to two. So um, I like the blinkers added there, but th those would be my two. I'm going to write six, 11, that's sort of as your A horses. And for your backups, I'm going to write as many as you can afford. That's a exactly. game we play sometimes here. Matt, how do you see it? Any more clarity to close things out? Yeah, well, I say first of all, I mean, pay attention to the uh, the also eligibles there uh, with the fourteen uh, Harrington Rocket. That horse gets in. I think is going to be very, very difficult in in this race. Uh, so I pay attention there, but I'll, I'll go with a few. Um, like I do like the eleven as well, uh, Shady Road, and I do like the uh, the number two uh, Poor Nui. Uh, I think uh, just ran against similar. I think it had it does need to step up in in, in this particular race here. Uh, but I think it's has run some good races. Maybe I look in the best form, but I think some dirtied up form there that I think could be uh, really competitive. One stat I'll throw out there for, for the two that I thought was interesting with, uh, with, with uh, Joe Sharp on dirt to turf, you know, with th decent sample, 32 starts, 31% winners with a $4 and 26 cent ROI. So I thought that jumped out at me. Wanted to pass, uh, pass that along. Uh, Cheetah road again, third start all upside here. I, I think this horse can certainly keep improving. Uh, in a race that you can go in a lot of different directions. So I do like a horse like that, that I think can, can really project well to, to jump, uh, uh, jump their figures in this race. Uh, I'll take a look at the seven uh, fascination. Uh, I, I'm curious to see what price we get here. You know, Cox sprints are out, you know, 28% winners. And I thought this one was interesting. And this is going to be something, Pete, I don't know if you're in it. I'm doing a much, much deeper dive into the Lasix discussion. And uh, your interview with uh, Sean Borman and uh, Paul Matisse inspired me to look back at it. I just didn't have enough data like a year and a half ago. I think there's enough now. Uh, but first time Lasix for Cox out of 157 starts, 34% winners. So I think that's it. I, I think that's interesting. I don't know if there's any there uh, kind of in a general sense, but uh, I'll put the seven in there as well. But I'm going to look at the uh, the two and 11 as A's and I'm going to back up with a B uh, with the seven uh, fascination. 
Great stuff. Really appreciate it. I'll list that if the 14 draws in will, would be your top pick though. Is that, is that right? I, I would, if the 14 draws in lone a and then everybody else, the two 11 and seven would be B's. I really think, uh, I really think Harrison rocket is going to be very tough. We'll I just don't think the source gets in. We'll continue that LASIX discussion another time. Brian, just before you go, just uh, curious if you have any updates on uh, open stable or the jocks room for us. The big, biggest update is um, with uh, with Epicenter, um, JK is going to make an Epicenter um, Ron Winchell uh, edition shirt. Oh, that's that cool. Be, that should become very popular uh, come Breeders' Cup Day. So what we'd like to do is have um, special limited edition for NFT holders, but then also have that Epicenter Ron Winchell shirt available for um, any racing fans. So it, it's a lot of fun stuff going on. And, uh, you know, it looks like Epicenter is probably going to lean on training up into the Breeders' Cup Classic. Okay, that's, yeah, that's the way the wind has been blowing on that one. And I, th I think it makes sense, uh, you know, given his overall trajectory as well. Great stuff from you all. If you want to learn more about uh, the, the Open Stable project, openstable.io, the website to go to, Racelens. You can check them out. We've got promo codes. I'll probably have read an ad elsewhere in the show that'll delineate all that. But, you know, Matt shows the power of that product every time he comes on these airwaves, which will hopefully happen again soon. Gentlemen, Godspeed this weekend in all your endeavors, and we'll be talking soon. Indeed, Pete. Thanks, Pete. As mentioned, there are a couple of different ways for In The Money listeners to get discounts on the Race Lens product, depending on if you're a new customer or an existing customer. Uh, Come back and try or extend your current plan and enjoy 40% off of any unlimited race lens subscription with the promo code in the money 40. That's four zero or new customers can sign up for an unlimited monthly subscription and get the first month for only $1 with the promo code in the money. So that's in the money for new customers in the money for zero for existing customers to learn more. Go to in the slash race lens. That's in the slash race lens. That's going to do it for this edition of the show, this marathon edition of the show. I want to thank all of today's guests. First and foremost, we want to thank our founding partners, the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation. You can give to them, trfinc.org slash players, or you can even still get a bottle or two that are left of the in the money whiskey you didn't make the appropriate size donation over there. Also 10 strike racing around here. We always like to root for the purple and black, but most of all, I want to thank all of you, the listeners for making these shows so much fun to do. This show has been a production of in the money media. We thank producer AJ first and foremost, pushing all the right buttons, making all the right cuts. He's in for producer Craig today. Our business manager is Drew Cotney. Our chief creative officers, Jonathan Kitchen. Wow. We had both of them on for the first time in a minute. I think I'm Peter Thomas Fornatel. May you win all your photos. I can do it.